it takes to bring this thing to an end, and should President Biden reconsider his latest decision to send hundreds of 2,000-pound bombs to Israel. I'm Sue O'Connell, in for Marjorie Egan. Back at home, it was the most-watched women's basketball game in history. 12 million people tuned in to watch the NCAA rematch between LSU's Angel Reese and Iowa's Caitlin Clark. We're going to talk about what the future holds for women's basketball with Trenny Casey, plus news of a proposal to build a new soccer stadium at Everett for the New England Revolution. It's all ahead on Boston Public Radio 89.7 GBH, live from the BPL. Live from NPR News in Washington, I'm Janine Herbst. Border security remains a huge motivating factor for Republicans. And as NPR's Domenico Montanaro reports, a new NPR PBS NewsHour Marist poll sheds light on why. 84 percent of Republicans say they want to see all migrants who came to the United States illegally deported. They believe that they're on solid ground politically on that because a majority of independents also feel that way as compared to fewer than one in four Democrats. Immigration has been at the heart of what has fueled Donald Trump's political rise, and it's a major focus of his 2024 campaign. And Paris Domenico Montanaro reporting. International criticism is growing after the Israeli airstrike in Gaza that left seven World Central Kitchen workers dead. Israel says the strike was a mistake. The charity has temporarily suspended deliveries to Gaza to protect workers. In an op-ed in the New York Times today, founder and chef Jose Andres says food is a universal human right, but he says workers need to be safe. A U.S. airman is taking on day three of a hunger strike in front of the White House protesting against the war in Gaza. NPR's Windsor Johnston has more. Senior Airman Larry Aber is standing in front of the White House holding up a sign that reads, Active Duty Airman Refuses to Eat While Gaza Starves. The 26-year-old says the military has a duty to uphold humanitarian and international law. What's happening right now is a breach of those laws. And I don't think that that's even ethically responsible from a military standpoint. He says he decided to speak out after the death of active duty airman Aaron Bushnell, who lit himself on fire in front of the Israeli embassy in February. Aber has said he's not intending to speak for the U.S. military. In a statement to NPR, the Pentagon says the airman's actions are under review. Windsor Johnston, NPR News. Oklahoma's Supreme Court heard arguments yesterday on the reparations for survivors of the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre. Ben Abrams with member station KWGS has more. Residents of Tulsa's historic Greenwood neighborhood, which was burned to the ground over a century ago, came together to watch lawyers for Viola Fletcher and Lessie Benningfield Randall, both 109 years old, argue that the city of Tulsa and the state were complicit in the massacre. Community member Consuelo Scott Miles says the lawsuit is long overdue. Reparations should have been given many, many years ago. But Keith Wilkes, an attorney for the Tulsa County Sheriff, says the massacre's lasting impacts aren't as severe as is being argued. For the men and women uh, who survived and stayed, the end of the massacre was also the beginning of another story. The lawsuit was originally dismissed by a Tulsa County judge last year. For NPR News, I'm Ben Abrams in Tulsa. In Finland, mourners gathered outside a school today laying flowers and lighting candles on a snowy landscape. This is NPR. Good morning. With the latest from the GBH Newsroom, I'm Henry Santoro. Falmouth will have surplus police shotguns destroyed at no cost to town residents. At a select board meeting this week, town manager Mike Renshaw made the announcement. The police department is currently making arrangements with the Massachusetts State Police Crime Lab firearms identification section, which uh, the facility is located in Maynard, to schedule a complete destruction of all 26 surplus shotguns. A group called the Falmouth Gun Safety Coalition lobbied the select board to allow private con uh, contributions to pay for the destruction of surplus weapons rather than trade them in towards the cost of new ones. The disposal of surplus weapons became controversial two years ago when some residents protested the police department's plan to trade in some of those assault rifles. Well, leave it to Costco, the gluttons of the food shopping world, to start offering weight loss drug prescriptions. The company is 
has launched a subscription-based weight loss program for members and non-members yesterday, which includes access to prescription weight loss drugs like Ozempic and Wegovy. The announcement says that members will pay as low as $179 for a three-month subscription to utilize resources from their health care partner, which is Sesame. But for $195, even non-Costco cardholders or members can enjoy the benefits as well. The program guide says that injectable drugs will be available only if a provider from Sesame finds the customer to be an applicable candidate. 44 degrees in Boston, this is GBH News. Support for NPR comes from C3 AI. C3 Generative AI works to enable rapid access to traceable, hallucination-free insights from enterprise systems using any LLM, helping turn the invisible into the obvious. C3.AI. This is NPR. Welcome to Boston Public Radio. I am Jim Browdy. Marjorie is again out today. She is back tomorrow. Sue O'Connell is sitting in for her again today. Hey, Sue, how hey, are you? Hey, good to see you. Nice to see you. We're thanks live at the me. Boston... What'd you say? I said, thanks for having me. Well, it's my pleasure. Thanks <laughs> for being here. We're live at the Boston Public Library, streaming on youtube.com slash GBH News. Ask the mayor... Obviously, with Mayor Wu, will be next Tuesday, April 9th, from 11 to 12 here. And I wanted to mention, because we love this location as much as we do, today is also Library Giving Day. It's a national one-day fundraising event to support your favorite library. Our favorite library is this one. If it's yours, too, you can go to bplfund.org. One last programming thing. In the 12 o'clock hour, we may make history. I'm Mm -hmm. not sure. I think so. We will have on the radio. This is a radio (laughs) show, correct? Last time, well, we are in many places, Jim, but our primary mission is radio. Radio, and it, it does stream, so you can watch it at youtube.com slash GBH News. We will have an acrobatics performance <laughs> from Hella Black. Uh, uh, Kai Bernard will be doing something called Lyra Lollipop or Lollipop Lyra or something. Uh, on the radio. So I wouldn't miss that if I were you, Sue. Well, luckily, I grew up listening to my mother's uh, radio tapes from, you know, the early days of radio. So I can do the commentary. Fabulous. So we'd happens. love you to do I'm that. Really That's terrific. That. Yes. But on a much more serious note, we talked briefly on the show yesterday about the killing of those World Central Kitchen aid workers in Gaza. Seven people dead. Palestinian, an Australian, a Pole, three Brits, and a dual U.S.-Canadian citizen. Israel has issued a rare mea culpa for the strike acknowledging it was a mistake. But even so, Prime Minister Netanyahu issued this response, it's unfortunate, it happens in war. Even amid international outrage and growing pressure from the United States population, Israel maintains their firm line in Gaza. They say they need to eradicate all of Hamas before the war can end. Israel's uniquely positioned in the Middle East has a right, of course, to defend itself against attacks like Hamas's bloody, murderous assault of October 7th. But are you concerned they are actually breeding terrorism with the way they're continuing to conduct this war? What do you make of Joe Biden's role in all of this? And could the killing of the seven World Central Kitchen angels, as Jose Andres calls them, be the tipping point in this endless struggle? 877 8970 to call or text. By the way, tomorrow, as I've mentioned, a guy who's been with us before, Gilly Roman, and I believe his cousin, Maya Roman, but family member, are going to be here to talk about two Israeli hostages in their family, one of whom was released after 54 days, one of whom is still being held. 877-301-8970. First thing you said to me this morning, Sue, was... Is this the tipping point? Is this the thing that will cause so much pressure on Netanyahu Mm -hmm. that that ceasefire that's been negotiated for ages happens and maybe even more? What's your answer? Yeah, I I think it is. And I, I, as I said, too, this is not to uh, diminish or uh, not pay attention to all of the atrocities that have been happening that should be a tipping point for Mm -hmm. any conflict. Um, But in particular, I think... uh, Part of the reason why this is resonating so much is that Jose Andres is such a popular uh, philanthropic person who has gone into many places, as Corby Kummer has, was talking to us about yesterday, mm-hmm. all around the world, in the United States, wherever there has been need. He has gone in and built this uh, effective way of bringing food to people who need it when they need it. And he couldn't be any more, I think, in a way, apolitical. Uh, and so uh, it's something that everyone can agree on, that 
this uh, terrible um, accident of war uh, has impacted someone who was trying to just do the basic good thing. And it is really resonating with people all across the world and with leaders all across the world. And in a way, and I, I, you can't talk about this without the politics of the situation, both the United States politics and the international politics, but you can be upset about this without worrying about what political price you would pay or political group you would upset. You know, by the way, I agree that Andres is generally above politics. He doesn't accept that this is an accident of mm -hmm. war. He said that he believes his angels, as he called the seven, were uh, targeted. He wrote a piece in the New York Times, which I hope you've all read, Jose Andres Let People Eat, talking about humanitarian aid, talking about the 43 million meals that they have prepared and delivered in Gaza. And by the way, a couple of million meals to Israelis in need as well, he mentions. He writes, Israel is better than the way this war is being waged. It is better than blocking food and medicine to civilians. It is better than killing aid workers who had coordinated their movements with the Israel Defense Forces. And Joe Biden says he was outspoken and heartbroken, uh, which I think is important to say, but this comes days after he quietly approved the uh, sending of, I think it's 1,800 2,000 pound bombs to uh, Israel. So the question, is this the point at which uh, Netanyahu decides there's got to be a different uh, strategy. And by the way, I, I, if I were living in Israel, uh, I too would support the total elimination of Hamas. Mm -hmm. I don't have the skills to say what's the best way to do that if this is not, but I know this is not, just th this, this, this simply is not. You know, there was a, a profile of some of the aid workers last night, and I have to say, it, the courage and commitment to their fellow human beings in the face of unimaginable danger all over the world yeah. with smiles and it's just, it's, it's unbelievable. And, and it, it's just, it is, as the president said, it's heartbreaking. So is this the critical moment? What do you think about Joe Biden? I am one who believes this could cost him the election mm -hmm. and give us uh, Donald Trump, particularly young voters. This is a brand new Pew Research Center poll. It says, not surprisingly, young Americans are much more sympathetic or concerned, I should say, about the, uh, the deaths of uh, innocent civilians in Gaza, they were critical in the last election to the uh, election of mm -hmm. Joe Biden. So we shall see. 877-301-8970. Yeah, one of the, uh, the challenges in having this discussion, of course, is I, I view Israel as uh, more than our ally, and I think about how I would be acting if this were the United States and how the United States Mm -hmm. was responding, and, and that's the viewpoint that I take here in talking about this, that I, I, to your point, we can't say enough that obviously Israel has the right to defend themselves, and Hamas is a terrible terrorist organization, but if the same thing happened to us, the United States, how would we be responding? And if we were responding the same way Israel is now, um, and these, you know, popular aid workers uh, were, were killed in either a terrible accident or a terrible overstep, uh, what would we be calling on our leaders to do? I agree. And, you know, you say the, the line that, uh, I'm not a big fan of Erin Burnett on CNN, but she has some very good questions and one of Netanyahu's spokespeople last night. The obvious question is how concerned are you or are you concerned about while you're trying to eradicate terrorists in Hamas, about breeding terrorists mm -hmm. uh, in Gaza uh, based upon what you're doing to their neighbors and their aid workers and their families. And I think that's a real serious concern if is the security of Israel matters to you, and we hope it does. In any case, Sophia in Cambridge, you're first on Boston Public Radio. Thank you much for calling. We appreciate it. Uh, greetings. Good morning. Hi. Um, having, having been to Israel, um, and for anyone who is Jewish, who has lived in Israel or visited Israel, it is undeniable that the Palestinians truly have been treated the way the Nazis treated the Jews in the ghettos. They are isolated. Their movements are completely restricted. Their homes have been taken and bulldozed by settlers, despite anything by the U.S. being able to prevent it. Um, and this situation truly was a powder keg waiting to happen. It's just incredibly sad and unwarranted for... Uh, Israel to continue its bombardment, especially since the Palestinians are innocent here. Period. They're innocent. And it is just unacceptable for Netanyahu to come out and say that this is sort of part of war. He has the power to stop it. He has the power to stop all of this. Um, 
and to look at the broader view as to where Israel is going to stand in the future because these poor Palestinians do not deserve what, what's happening to them at all. My heart breaks every day, and I, I just want to see it end. And at this juncture, we can't say one hostage is worth the life of a thousand innocent people. Um, I mean, how do we rebuild after this at this juncture? Well, by the way, the hostage families, and we're going to have two of them with us tomorrow, the Israeli hostages, as you know, we're demonstrating by the tens of thousands. Uh, they're not happy about how this is being mm -hmm. handled either for obviously different reasons. Sophia, that was an excellent call, and we're glad you made it. Thank you. Speaking of what Netanyahu had to say, here it is. Here is Israeli uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. This is, he was speaking in Hebrew. This is through a CNN English translation, and he's responding to the news of the killing of the seven uh, World Central Kitchen people. Unfortunately, in the last day, there was a tragic incident where our forces unintentionally struck innocent people in the Gaza Strip. It happens in war, and we are thoroughly investigating. But I'll tell you, talk about tin ear. Uh, it happens in war. I mean, to say you're grief-stricken, it was a horrible mistake. All, I mean, what else can you say? Mm -hmm. But it happens in war is so callous. And again, if you believe Jose Andres, and I, I admire him as much as I practically admire anybody on the planet, his position it was it was not unintentional. His position is their location was shared with the IDF, the Defense Forces of mm -hmm. Israel, that all of their cars were Are marked, marked. Clearly marked. And, uh, um, and it was an aerial attack. So at least his contention, and there is going to be an investigation, was it was not unintentional, but as I said before, it was targeted. Regardless, regardless, there are seven people who dedicated their lives to helping others who are uh, dead. Let's go to uh, Dana in Medway. Dana, thanks for calling in. You're on Boston Public Radio. Hi, Dana. Hi, thanks for taking my call. Sure. Um, as the previous um, caller said, this is whole thing is so heartbreaking. I can't stand to hear one more thing come out of this war. Um, but the one thing I just wanted to add was that as, as often as we're calling for ceasefires from Israel, mm -hmm. I feel like there's no one calling Hamas to stop what they're doing as well. The ceasefire has to be both ways. Um, and it's upsetting to have just one party be charged with a ceasefire um, agreement when it really needs to be both. So I would just like to hear more people call for Hamas to surrender. Um, and I think that would help things along as well. We appreciate Dana. Thank you very much uh, for your call. I thought your first point was, good, was that people were not condemning what Hamas had done and continues yeah. to do. I think every decent person I know is, but you're right. It, they obviously, they appear to be the holdup in terms of the mm -hmm. ceasefire thing. Israel seems to be bought into whatever the latest plan is, and you're right. There should be a mutual call. And that to that correct. point, that should be all we should be talking about, yeah. right? But we're not talking about that because of things like this that are happening. And, you know, the other, the other rich history that um, America and other Western nations have is going into areas, being in areas, creating more problems um, that they're trying to fix and then leaving and then letting the, the children of the people who they have uh, uh, effed over, for lack mm -hmm. of a better word, turn into terrorists and end up hating us. We've it done is. it. We've done it. We've yes, done we've it, done it yeah. all across the, the Middle East. We've done it through Africa as, as, as well as other people have. So looking at the generations of Palestinians who have lived in this situation and now what they're going through, and again, Hamas should be, is a terrorist organization, should be eliminated. But when you are growing people who are going to grow up to hate you, it, it doesn't seem like it's the best strategy to solve the problem. I, I, I would agree, and uh, as people often do, which they should in a situation like this, say to Sue O'Connell or me, what's the alternative? And that's, as they say, above our pay grade. Yeah. It's just fairly clear, I think, to almost everybody who I respect, that this is not an appropriate response. It's gone way past. And by the way, that was the case in my estimation before the seven aid workers were killed a couple of days ago. We're going to go. I, I believe it's Rama. Help me uh, pronounce your name, Rama, in Central Mass. Hey there. How are you? Yes, yes, it is. How are you? Good. Great. Great, great. So, uh, yeah, what Sophia said and Dana said and what you just said, Sue, are so, so, so appropriate. Um, and I, I, I'll admit, I don't know enough about the situation, but it just seems to me uh, that we have been supporting Israel with a free pass ever since World War II. I wasn't born at that time, but, uh, and, and yes, there was World War II, there was genocide, there was millions and millions of Jewish people killed. 
I visited Auschwitz. My heart goes out to them. But uh, what we give a free pass to Israel to do is deplorable. And it seems to me we always over and over and over give Israel a free pass. What Dana talked about, what was it, Sophia, about going to visit Israel and seeing how the Palestinians are treated. Sophia. I, again, I don't know enough about that, but it seems to me we always favor Israel over everyone else. Why is that? Well, Why don't I, we see yeah. a, a fair economist uh, field? Those are excellent points, Rama. I mean, we do it, again, I don't want to be like, this is what the United States all, does all the time, but uh, we do it throughout the world, supporting things and countries and people that we don't necessarily agree with. Israel is an important ally to us in many ways. It's the, the, the most important in that it's part the of the cork, world. Yeah. It's the cork in that entire area. Uh, and there are a number of uh, geopolitical, and uh, certainly Julia Kaim can speak more to this than I can. But it makes a lot of sense why we support Israel just from a strategic ally standpoint. Um, you know, but again, the bigger question too is United States tends to do this. Look at Afghanistan. Look what we did in Afghanistan and, and where we ended up with Afghanistan. Yeah, and not, to, not to equate Afghanistan and Israel, but... Uh, Rama, thank you for your call. But the question, you mentioned Juliet will be with us uh, uh, sometime in the uh, noon hour, I think at 12 actually, is uh, I would like to hear her, and she mm -hmm. has much greater expertise than at least I do, uh, why, why are there no conditions attached to providing weaponry to Israel, like people like Senator Van Hollen from uh, Maryland, Senator Sanders, Senator Warren, Senator Markey, have uh, suggested, not saying not to support Israel, but to support Israel based upon certain conditions in terms of their behavior. By the way, they still say Rafa is on their agenda with 1.2 million Palestinians there, maybe not till May, but I mean, another nightmare of death mm -hmm. waiting to happen. I just you know, and a point that Juliet made a few months ago if, uh, was, you know, Israel's our ally and we are airdropping aid in. Yeah, it's you know, almost never happened with an ally. We that's should right. be able yeah. to just go in and bring aid if that's what Israel says we can do. Uh, Nathaniel, you're in Rockport. You're in Boston Public Radio. Uh, welcome to the show. Hi. Good morning. Thank you very much. Yeah, I wanted to chime in because I've been a humanitarian aid worker for over oh. 20 years. Oh. I was in Haiti before, during, and after the earthquake. I was in Sierra Leone for the Ebola outbreak. This is, this is what I do. This is my day job. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the attack, I don't buy the story that it was an accident. Mm -hmm. It was three separate vehicles that were 2.4 kilometers apart. There is no way you can accidentally hit three separate vehicles individually over a period of time especially when the IDF had coordinated with World Central Kitchen and knew exactly where they were at that uh -huh. time. My concern as a humanitarian worker here is I'm worried that this attack was not only not an accident, but intentional to prevent other aid companies from feeling safe in going in there. There's been an unprecedented number of deaths of aid workers, 104 since October 7th. Actually, it's closer to 200. It's closer to 200, Nathaniel. Uh, it's which it's, is which is just it's un unforgivable. And and so, you know, the fact that they claim Netanyahu said there is no Hamas in northern uh, Gaza, and yet he said at the same time, no more aid to northern Gaza. So you know, if there's no aid to northern Gaza, Hamas is not there. How can you not feed the people that are there? It's you just, know. It is an unspeakable terror. You know, Nathaniel, the fear you have, I think, has already been realized. I mean, not only is World Central Kitchen, which had provided, according to Jose Andres, 43 million meals in Gaza, uh, withdrawing, at least for now, other humanitarian aid organizations, because they want to protect their people too, are talking about withdrawing their services as well. So the ripple effect of this catastrophe is, uh, is being felt. We really thank you both for your work and your call, Nathaniel. We're glad you called. Thanks so much. Uh, we'd like you to stay with us. We'd like to take more of your calls and your texts. So stay with us. You're listening to Boston Public Radio, 89.7 GBH. We're live from the BPL. Countertops are popular in kitchens and bathrooms. They're beautiful and easy to maintain, but global demand is driving a spike in a deadly disease among workers. This is a preventable workplace illness 
that needs to be taken very seriously. That story plus today's top global news. Listen next time on The World. This afternoon at 3, here on GBH News 89.7. Support for our programs comes from you. And Mass General Cancer Center, dedicated to providing compassionate care and cancer specialists who are experienced in the cancer you have. When you hear the word cancer, their team is ready. Learn more at massgeneral.org slash cancer. And h h the Handel and Haydn Society. The h h Orchestra and Chorus imbue new life into Bach's choral masterpiece, his B minor Mass, April 5th and 7th at Symphony Hall. Tickets at handelandhaydn.org. Welcome back to Boston Public Radio. Jim Browdy, Sue O'Connell sitting in for Marjorie. Marjorie's back tomorrow. We're live at the Boston Public Library, streaming at youtube.com slash GBH News. Mayor Wu joins us a week from yesterday here at the library, uh, April 9th. If you're just tuning in, we're getting your thoughts about the war in Gaza uh, and obviously what kind of uh, impact uh, the, this, uh, the killing of these seven aid workers of World Central Kitchen is going to have, if any, on the conduct and the trajectory of this uh, this war. 877-301-8970 is the number. We're getting uh, a lot of texts. Uh, I just read one, and I'm sorry I missed who it was from, but the gist of it was the point that we talked about before the show when What's we that? talked on the show. Um, you know, lots of innocent people have been killed during this conflict, during this the attack on Israel, during the response, uh, and the texter said, you know, other people are innocent too. These people who were the aid workers are not the only innocent people, that not to put them in, in um, contrast to folks who have been killed that were also uh, not doing bad things. And, and, and that's the conflict I'm having a bit with this. What do you mean? Well, talking about why would this be a tipping point when it feels to me as if it is, uh, when other things have happened that you would hope would move p people closer to having discussions about a ceasefire and finding another way. But it is what it is on one hand for me. So if, if, if this is causing people to want to take more action or be more vocal, I'll take it. You know, uh, uh, Unfortunately. I, I think that texter nailed it, and I'm with that person and with you on this thing. I, I mentioned the other day, there's certain stories that really stay with you. There was the, I believe he's the Minister of Culture for the Palestinian Authority in West Bank, wrote an op-ed in the Washington Post. I've mentioned this a few times, but it's so incredibly painful. His uh, mother-in-law, uh, who's in Gaza, died, even though she had something that was curable, according to him, because uh, she couldn't get through the bombings to get to a hospital. He went on to say that his father-in-law was killed in a bombing not too long ago, his uh, mother and father-in-law's children, uh, the two sons were killed in that same bombing, and the two daughters uh, survived, one uh, deeply traumatized, apparently to the point of virtual non-function, and the other one lost both their legs and one arm. That's one family, one family in Gaza, and that texter is right, why, why do we need to seize on this? And we shouldn't have to, is the answer to the question, mm -hmm. but we are. Karen and Brighton, I'm sorry. Karen and Brighton, you're next. Hi. Hi there. Thanks for having me. Um, I want to say hi to Sue because she's an old colleague of mine. Oh. Um, oh. Hi, Karen. Yeah, it's Karen. Hi. How you doing? Good. What's your whole name? Tell her. Oh, Karen Hurst. Oh, hi, Karen. <laughs> she's smiling broadly, Karen, I want you to know. Oh, good. I'm, I'm happy to. Um, well, I wanted to say that, you know, in the world view, I don't want the U.S. to be by Trump. And by the same token, I don't think Israel should be designed, designed, uh, excuse me, defined by Netanyahu. I mean, look at the approach in Israel. They're not getting enough coverage. I think that, you know, a lot of Israelis do not support him. And um, to the young people, I'd like to say, you know, if you don't want to support Biden, just think about what would happen if Trump got back into office. You know, Karen, I, we have a horrible connection, unfortunately, but I'm going to restate what you said. As you said that and all I'll of affirm America it because I know who she is. shouldn't be judged <laughs> by uh, Donald Trump, just like all Israelis should not be judged by uh, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu. Uh, first of all, I would disagree with your position about Trump. The American people elected Donald Trump. 
uh, he represented, sadly, a majority of opinion, or at least a plurality of opinion, and we should be judged by the decision in 2016 to choose him as our leader. In terms of Israelis, while I would agree with you in the abstract, the most recent poll that I saw, close to two-thirds of Israelis are against humanitarian aid to, uh, to Gaza. So uh, in the abstract, I think you were totally right, particularly in light of the fact that I also think a majority of Israelis want elections and want Netanyahu replaced, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, a majority of them continue to believe that humanitarian aid is not what the right course for their uh, country is vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinians. Karen, it's good to hear from you. Thank you. Coffee for soon, the, Karen. Thanks for the, calling but in. You know, the first point she makes about right. not being, a lot of people say that. I don't mean to jump down uh, Karen's throat. Uh, Trump is not some outlying fringe, he is a fringe candidate. He was elected president of the United States. You can say the Russians helped, I'm sure they did. Whatever the hell it was, the reality is the American people decided this is the kind of person you want as a leader. And if the election were now, the person I respect more than any other when it comes to political analysis, John King, because he plays it right down the middle, says this guy who is essentially a rapist, a fraudster, an insurrectionist uh, uh, would be the next president of the United States mm -hmm. of America. So I think it is fair to judge us by uh, Donald Trump. I say every day after election, America gets the president you voted for. Exactly and that's right. what it is. And it's, it's the same um, with Israel to, to some degree. And while a great number of people are not supporting Netanyahu, many still are too. So let's go to uh, Mitch from St. Louis, Missouri. Hey, Mitch, welcome. Hello, Mitch, welcome. Oh, thank you. Thank um, you. Yeah. I, uh, without uh, underestimating the horrors and um, tragedies that is associated with this war and to these workers especially, there's a real danger on the world stage for Israel to have a unilateral uh, ceasefire. Because it essentially represents a roadmap to every other terrorist group that they can win through international pressure just by hiding behind the population. You know, to Hamas has cynically um, used human shields, using the entire population of, of Gaza as a human shield. And do we want to bow to that kind of strategy at the risk of teaching every other terrorist group in the world? Now, I, I'm touched and horrified by what's happening in Gaza, but I can't think of a way around it without surrendering to that strategy. Well, Mitch, I would, I would agree, and, but also argue back that Hamas did not invent this strategy. This is a strategy as old as time, uh, and that might also make an argument that we should have, be able to better address the issue uh, and understand that that's what Hamas has been doing, as well as terrorist organizations, again, since, since the beginning of time, have used human shields, have lived among populations in order to protect themselves. And, but, and I'd add to that, Mitch, I, I think you raise a legitimate, I don't think Sue's suggesting you don't raise oh, right. a, yes. a legitimate issue, but I think the answer is, with any ceasefire, hopefully one that lasts longer than six weeks, it can't be Israel left to defend itself from what remains of Hamas. It's got to be the international community led by the United States, which is urging Israel to engage to agree to a ceasefire that uh, participates in the protection of the Israeli people. So uh, I think you're right, but I don't think it naturally leads at all to the kind of uh, uh, out of proportion response from uh, the Israeli government. Mitch, though, thank you for listening in St. Louis, and thank you much for the uh, for the call. So we'll we'll continue this. We're going to talk to John King about it near the end of the show. We're going to talk to Juliet Kayyem about it at uh, at uh, noon. And I would really urge you to read uh, the great Jose Andres's piece in the New York Times. They said it's called Jose Andres, Let People Eat. Uh, it was in today's uh, New York Times. Great. And I appreciate all the respectful and um, helpful calls yep. and a good discussion when I'm happy to have been involved in. So thanks so much. We're going to take a quick break right now, and then she's going to be here. It's the Trenny Casey experience. I'm renaming <laughs> your show uh, from NBC Sports Boston. You're listening to Boston Public Radio, 89.7 GBH. We're live from the Boston Public Library and streaming on YouTube.com GBH News.
Behind every headline. The pharmaceutical company that manufactures Flovent has replaced it with a generic version, and some health insurers aren't covering it. Is a human story. The fact that patients are dealing with this, that families are dealing with this, that pediatricians all day, every day, are trying to figure out how to get an inhaler into the hands of their patients is unacceptable. GBH News with NPR. What matters to you? Support for GBH comes from you. And Babson College. Students can gain the know-how to become a successful leader at the number one graduate school in entrepreneurship, ranked by U.S. News and World Report. Virtual open house, April 17th. Babson.edu slash grad open house. And Mass General Brigham Health Plan. Innovative plans, coverage, and a broad network of doctors. Mass General Brigham Health Plan. With you every day. For more information, you can visit MassGeneralBrighamHealthPlan.org. Welcome back to Boston Public Radio. Sue O'Connell's in for Marjorie. Marjorie's back tomorrow. I'm Jim Browdy. We're live at the Boston Public Library, streaming at youtube.com slash gbhnews. Mayor Wu joins us a week from yesterday, April 9th, from 11 to 12, for Ask the Mayor from the Boston Public Library. Talk about a 180. We're going to go from <laughs> immense pain to one of the most joyful experiences that I and 12 million others had just a couple of days ago. And joining us to discuss it is Trenny Casey, anchor and reporter for NBC Sports Boston. Hi, Trenny. Hi, guys. Hello Hi, there. Trenny. What a game. Oh, my gosh. She was at Olivia Rodrigo. Yeah, I didn't get to that? see it, so I was at Olivia Rodrigo. Oh, was it a great show? It was a Who great, great show. Who cares She's quite show. the rocker. Can she I is. play a little sound before we start? Yeah, of course. By the way, I was forgot the game was on. I go on to some website. They say 45 to 45 at the half. I then turn it on to begin the second half, and three minutes of this Caitlin Clark was unlike anything I've She's ever seen. Here she is. Here's the ESPN commentator, Ryan Rococo. I think that's Whoever he is, going <laughs> wild on four of Caitlin Clark's, she plays for Iowa's nine threes at Monday night's game against LSU. Here it is. Catch, fire, and hit Clark. Oh my! From Schenectady, Clark! She's possessed. Another deep one. Is good! <laughs> that is exactly how I felt watching this thing. It was so exciting. So remember when Marcus Smart played for the Celtics and sure. every time you took a three, you were like, oh God, oh God, oh God. <laughs> Because you didn't think he was going to make it. It's like the exact opposite with Cl Caitlin Clark. Every time she launched up a three, when she didn't make it, you were like, oh, weird. That was nothing. That was not nothing but net because that's usually, I mean, it's not even like it rims around or hits anything. It just, it is the literal term of nothing but net. She is a fantastic player to watch. I love, there was a point, I think, you know, maybe with about, so uh, this is a little weird and confusing. In men's basketball, there's two halves of 20 minutes in college. Mm -hmm. But in women's basketball and like everybody, uh, all, all other forms of basketball, there are four quarters. So I think it was like maybe a couple minutes into the fourth quarter and she nailed another long three. And she just went across the middle of, her, of the court, her arms yeah, outstretched, making this like just, I am the queen of the world face. And it was so exhilarating to watch. But it was also, listen, it, like to watch Angel Reese, who you missed the, mm -hmm. the, the first half of the game, their star on LSU. She, um, she hurt her ankle uh, or like eh, midway through the first half, and you could tell she was not the it same could, player late. She wasn't shooting as well, but do you know she still grabbed 20 rebounds? Like these are unbelievable basketball players. It was a wildly entertaining game. Uh, my 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 husband Sean and I are on a text chain with our friend Casey, and this is Casey a guy, not Casey a girl. Yeah. And Casey could not stop texting me about the women's games. Like he, everybody I knew was enthralled with it. Most people at work, I probably shouldn't admit this, but we watched LSU Iowa, not Celtics Hornets. Yeah. Well, can I speak with that first? <laughs> Second, just one more minute, and then the Miz uh, a good one, though. Rodrigo on Sports can participate in, in this thing. You know, as the game is going along, and I'm watching Angel Reese and, and, and Clark, who is just a magician, two things stood out. Most people know about the three-point line. I and mean, even when you're watching the pros, maybe not Steph Curry, but generally the players try to position themselves so their toes are a hundredth of an inch right. beyond the three-point line. They put up a graphic during the game Clark's average made three point uh, uh, three pointer is four almost four feet beyond the the three point line. I mean, the woman crosses half court and she's ready to shoot the ball. I mean, I, it's unbelievable. I'd have to imagine. You know how this year they did Steph Curry and Sabrina. I asked. That's I asked exactly though. what I was. I'd thinking. have to imagine Caitlin Clark can 
easily, it's proven she can easily shoot from an NBA three range. Like I would guess she'll be a part of the all-star game next year. And that will maybe start to be a more common occurrence where you see players from the WNBA play alongside or against players from the NBA. And I don't think it's long before a woman like Caitlin Clark wins. Yeah, you know, one last thing I'll say about this. And then Sue, even though you didn't watch it, you made a horrible choice. You can participate <laughs> in this too. A friend, I don't even know if this is true, so I should have looked it up. But a friend of mine texted me this morning who is a man who is wild over this thing yeah. and named said two things. One, he asked me a question. Uh, how many women college basketball players can you name? And I said at least five or six now. More healing. How many can you <laughs> how many can you name in the men's final four? And I said I can name the center for Purdue because he's seven oh, four. Zach, Zach Eady. That's the only one player in men's. And the second thing, and that part is true. Second part I didn't confirm. He said he looked up the average viewership, did I get this right? Yes, for the World Series last year, it was 9 million oh, I saw this. fans and 12 million yeah. watched this women's Elite Eight basketball game. It is incredible. And it's funny because it's actually like the LSU Iowa game definitely overshadowed the other games that were happening in the in the women's uh, Sweet 16 and Elite Eight over the weekend. The game that came right after Iowa LSU, Paige Beckers, who um, missed parts of two seasons, all of last season with an ACL. She leads the UConn women, the Connecticut, the, uh, the, uh, the Lady Huskies. Um, she has led them back to the Final Four. They have six players who have been are out for the season. Their I bench know, is only like two or three players deep. I mean, they have. she has carried, they, she is a dynamic, fantastic player. They're gonna take on Iowa in the Final Four. When's that, Friday? Friday, I believe they're, yeah, they're fr Friday, wait, no. Friday and Sunday. Friday, Sunday, yes, because the men's Final Four is Saturday, Saturday and, and then Monday. the championship game Here's is a little Monday. Paige uh, Becker sound from UConn, just a little bit. Final two minutes. Becker's off the bounce. Pulls up in the lane for two. A great job of anticipating. Here's Becker's in a late clock through the contact. Just too talented. <laughs> it's really, it's like thrilling kind, of, it's thrilling stuff. Are you sad you missed this? Uh, a little bit. I can watch it again anytime I want. Well, and I have a question You'll get for to you, see Kay. the Final Four. The Final Four is going to be great. South Carolina is trying to go uh, wire to wire, mm -hmm. undefeated. NC State is just like the men's team. As long as there's not like a Taylor Swift concert or something, I'll be able to make it. So She's, 20. She is not back on tour until I know April. that. I know you know that. <laughs> So I don't know if it was last year or two years ago, I came on your show yes. and we talked about women's basketball. Yes. I don't remember if it was about March or if it was about the- I think it was like Women's History Month, right? We did there kind you of go, like so it was March, yeah. yeah. And I got a lot of flack on the Twitters because I said, I wish we could just call it basketball or make sure we say men's basketball, and women's basketball. I had to prove that I actually had played basketball and coached basketball, so I knew a few things about basketball. But I'm wondering, I think I said then that I always thought that the tipping point for women's sports to finally get this sort of enthusiasm from all sorts of people is when you get some player that you really can yeah. redefine the game and gambling. Oh, and yeah. once gambling became, once men, women, whomever could bet more easily on women's sports, it would suddenly become the thing to watch. Do you think that's part of what's happening I, here? Oh, I think it's twofold. I'm sure betting plays a part. Like, you know, I'm reading a preview of the LSU-Iowa game, and I'm mad now that I didn't place money on Flo, <laughs> on, uh, Flo J. Johnson, uh, who is another great player for LSU, um, because I think her over-under, there was a prop bet over-under, she'd score 15 and a half points, and it seemed easy, and she easily surpassed that. I think she had 24 or 25 points. I was like, I just should have put $10 on that. I would have won like 35 or 40 bucks. <laughs> so there's that. But I also think it, honestly, to Jim's point, it comes down to stars. Like, I can name two players, two players in the men's Final Four. Zach Eady from Purdue, the big, like, seven-foot guy. Seven four. And then the other big guy, uh, DJ Burns. Um, oh, he's the huge guy the for North Carolina State. He's the huge guy for North State. Carolina State. He's got, you know, like, the, he's just got, like, these long braids in his hair, and he's this big, rumbling guy that looks more like a left tackle than he does. 300 pounds, I think. Yeah, wow. somewhere he's a near huge that. player. He's huge. Wow. And honestly, the re part of the reason I know his name is because NC State upset my alma mater, Marquette. Marquette. So, like, I was I watching and listening to the names. There are not, the women's game is benefiting from familiarity. So, like, next year, Juju Watkins isn't going to leave 
leave USC. She's USC, right? She's going to stay at USC. She's going to keep playing. Well, Angel so like, Reese isn't the senior, is she? Well, Angel Reese, so she has a choice. So she's what they're calling a, co and so is Caitlin Clark. They're both COVID seniors. So they're able to have oh. a fifth year of eligibility because of the lost year. But Clark COVID. has said she's going to go to she's the WNBA. She's going to the WNBA. Uh -huh. And she has been um, offered $5 million dollars from uh, what is it's the um, the three like the three ball league that Ice Cube owns. Oh. Um, it's a it's a it's it's mostly male basketball players, but they've offered her five million dollars to take part. So those are the types of players that honestly, although Caitlin Clark, from what I read, made like three point one million dollars on NIL deals. If you watched that game on on um, Monday night. It was, the commercials were her and no, Juju true. Watkins. Totally like, it was true. so it's... cool. Like, it's, they, like, I don't see DJ Burns or Zach Eady getting, like, big time commercials. There is a player from Duke who paints his nails, and he got a deal from Sally Hansen. Oh, that's like, nice. the, like, the nail the polish. The nail polish. But probably not. I mean, Caitlin Clark is doing state farm commercials with, um... Uh, Reggie, Reggie, uh, why am I forgetting his last name? The three-point shooter. Great shooter the great from shooter Indiana. from Indiana. Reggie Miller. Reggie Miller. I think I was going to say like Reggie, I don't know. Yeah, Reggie yeah. Miller. Um, and then there's one other, there's one other NBA player whose name I can't, I can't even think of right now. Who is it? Jimmy oh, it is Butler. Jimmy Butler. Oh, I Miami. should know that. That's my, that's my oh, alma mater. Oh, my gosh. Train. That's right. It was Jimmy Butler. It was Jimmy Butler and Reggie Miller. She's doing Gatorade commercials. Juju Watkins is in a commercial with Joel Embiid. Like, these are not small, little, like, one-off things that they do on Instagram. But you know, that's also what makes women's sports, I think. It just, once you're in the forefront and people find someone they like and someone that they don't like, which is, you know, I think LSU played the role of the quote-unquote villain then you have a storyline mm -hmm. to root for, right? You know, the, the, uh, the flip side of this, which I hope is the last time we'll ever have to talk about <laughs> it. A couple of oh. years ago, we <laughs> talked about the video of the women's locker room for some team. Was it Oregon or somebody? Or oh, no, it was, it was the, the weight Olympics. Room. It the was, weight no, room, yeah. The weight room. It was the weight room at the, NCAA, the women's, oh, right, right. The women's for one NCAA team. tournament. Right. No, not for one team. For no, all, all the teams. It was teams. essentially a little yeah. stand with like four weights on. And then yes. they went to the men's thing, which is obviously this incredibly sophisticated yeah. Yeah. thing. So you thought that'd be the end of it. But then we learned this part is unbelievable. Was it Sally Jenkins who wrote this? piece about Sally what a Jenkins disgrace it was, piece, yes, that the, the three-point line, which obviously has an exact distance, and is important, was <laughs> mismeasured on one of the two sides of the games in the in West Portland, Coast. and the West region. And another example, they assigned an official to a game who graduated from, from one of the two schools. Yes, and that so was they the had first, to remove her in like the, the middle of game. the damn game. And the point that Sally Jenkins and some of the coaches, women's coaches yeah. are making, this would never happen except in women's basketball. My sense is after the wild success of this round, they're going to be treated like equals down the line. You yeah, know? I mean, you would, you would hope that they stop being an afterthought because to me, these mistakes are because that, that the women's game has been an afterthought. Exactly. Like they put all, the NCAA puts their money and their resources into the men's game. Now, while the men's uh, Elite Eight game between Duke and NC State did outrate uh, Iowa LSU, I'm one was surprised. on a, one, but one was on a Sunday, uh -huh. right? It was like a Sunday late afternoon, Easter Sunday, you're home with your family. Like you have to take those factors into mm -hmm. consideration as well. There was no Olivia Rodrigo concert <laughs> in Boston <laughs> on Sunday night. It was Monday and Tuesday night. But you, I mean, those types of things, you know, have to be thought about. I mean, essentially there was only a 3 million viewership difference between Duke NC State, Duke, one of the perennial programs in men's basketball and Iowa LSU on a Monday night at 7 o'clock. You know, one last thing about uh, Caitlin Clark, and uh, the only thing that worries me a little bit is other than defense, it's a one-woman team. I mean, I know people can say, I mean, they, well, they play. Kate Miller, the team captain, Kate yeah, Miller, she but, scored, I think, I mean, Clark obviously had 41 points, but I think Kate Miller had like, like 20 25 or something. Yeah. points. But you know, the, the amazing thing, and I'm not suggesting I'm a student of the game, is as great as her shooting was, remembering back to the early days, not the early days, the whole days of uh, bird magic, the passing by this woman, the sense oh. she has of the court. I don't want to get lost in the weeds, but every pass led the, her teammate How about to the, the exact perfect spot to the inch well, and it where was, they had to be. They showed the replay of this on Monday night. She had a, oh, I mean, it was like diagonal, not quite fully cross court. She was like, 
um, uh, uh, you know, on the, like to the LSU side, on the LSU side of the of the basket, and she telegraphed sort of diagonally in for an easy layup to her teammate. It might have been Kate Miller, and they showed how far it was. It was something like 57 <laughs> feet, and it was just like on a line, nothing, yeah. on a line to her. It was unbelievable. She's amazing, and also she's a thin woman, obviously and insanely yeah. fit. Yes, but she's not. I mean, she, it's just it's she's incredible. Strong. And the good news, you know, I was, you know what I was going to say when I mentioned to you a couple of weeks ago. That's what you were referencing. I think my fear is that uh, it's so tied to Caitlin Clark that a la sort of like when Pele came to America mm. to play professional soccer, it lasted while he was here and then disappeared. The point you made, there are a lot of stars now. There while Caitlin Clark is number one, there are a ton of other really talented, engaging women who can really play, who are going to be there even when she goes to the pros. Absolutely. So I, I, think, I think it is a, and it is, again, it is a game where you just, can't make enough in the WNBA yet yeah. that you can actually make more by staying in college, getting lucrative NIL deals, mm -hmm. and grow the college game, which will then, in turn, just like men's basketball yeah. for a long time, grew the NBA game that way. Nothing happens overnight. One other fun little Caitlin Clark fact before we, before we go, because yeah. we're playing UConn. She has uh, come out publicly and said that uh, UConn was always her dream oh, yeah, school, but they didn't this. even recruit her. So she'll have a little chip uh -huh. on her shoulder. <laughs> it's always great. a good. She'll that's have a great. Chip so on her shoulder. speaking of happy people, uh, soccer fans are on the in our region are about potentially to be happy after what a decade Emphasis or so. On maybe trying. Maybe. maybe right. Maybe there may be a stadium maybe. in Everett uh, maybe. for specifically for the Revs. Right. So, you know, do you remember how many stadium um, ideas there have been for this this stadium? Have they ever come out with renderings like this? Though? Oh, have I don't we know ever, if there's been a rendering. There might have been so an Olympic rendering for... I How just, do you pronounce that? Wadet? Wadet, I don't know. Wadet, that's that's, that's part of the problem. Yeah, 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 there yeah. might have been... Post-Olympics, that was But you think the rendering... Started. There were five. There have been five possible locations for yes. this stadium. You feel like this... Because there's a rendering? Well, no, I guess I just feel like they're, they're clearly... I think they're playing on the emotions of people. Look what we mm -hmm. could put down there. It looks like a beautiful, st it looks like, so we should back up for those of yeah. you who don't know what we're talking about. Good job, about. Trenny. Um, the Revs have been looking for a soccer specific stadium for, as Sue pointed out, decades. Right now they play in Foxborough at the Patriots home stadium, Gillette Stadium. It is not suited for soccer. It holds like 80,000 people. Like unless you're hosting a World Cup game, that's just not the type of numbers you're gonna draw in MLS. Most soccer crazed cities, Portland, in Seattle, Kansas City, they have their own soccer-specific stadiums that hold anywhere between 25,000 to, you know, 35, 40,000 people. So the Kraft family, which owns both the Patriots and the Revs, are proposing a $25,000 soccer... 25,000 Sorry, 25,000 That'd be great. I'll take yeah, two. Great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Robert Kraft's like, let me see what I got in my wallet. Um, sorry, 25,000 seat stadium in Everett. It'd be like across the Mystic River mm -hmm. from um, the casino, from Encore, Boston Harbor Casino. It looks like it's got... It's not complete... It's open air, but kind of covered. It's kind of got... looks uh, like that little half circle in, in the middle. Mm -hmm. Ideally, it would be natural grass. Um, like... There are thoughts um, that uh, Lionel Messi, who plays for Inter Miami, will not come and play when, when he faces the Revs at, at Gillette because it's, it's turf Ooh. and he does He's not. He's not going to play in a 25,000 seat stadium. Oh, sure he will. The biggest star in the world? Yes, because he gets I mean, paid he's, the in, same. he's paid. His <laughs> issue is not the number of people. His it's issue is he doesn't like to. No, no, his issue is he doesn't like to play on turf oh, because turf is oh, terrible for I your see, knees. See, and if you make a cut in soccer and he blows out his knee, okay. it's all over. Like yeah. that's he's playing in. He in, doesn't care like, how many people. Yeah, he doesn't care how many people. If they pack twenty five thousand and it's twenty five thousand rabid fans, but there is some pushback. Obviously, the mayor of Everett really wants this. It would be an economic boon for the city of Everett. Um, I know Mayor Wu. I'm, you guys are going to talk to her on Tuesday. I'm sure she'll have. Some thoughts on this. She, uh, um, her, the contention, according to the Globe, we forgot to bring it up with her, I think, last month. We'll do it on Tuesday. Is that sh the Boston was not consulted adequately, considering it's right on the border. Yeah, yes. and I think this is also, if just to, to echo the Encore conversations, you know, Everett ba and Charlestown are very close to each other. Where yes. the city line is, yeah. is is clear, but it's it will impact Boston. Absolutely. I mean, traffic. Just think mm -hmm. about the traffic. At, is it Everett Circle or what's what? Is it Rutherford Circle? Like yeah. you know, kind of where you go, like on a Main Street in a Charlestown. You know, they're saying that you're one mile from um, the Garden. Sullivan Station. Oh, 
um, T stop in terms of um, you know public transportation. They're going to be offering ferries. That's It'd be the like proposal. no parking, from what yeah, I read. Like almost no parking. Almost no parking. So at least maybe you'd be encouraged to take public transportation, take a ferry. They would build. I think they're trying to build like maybe even like a walking bridge from one side to the other. The other issue is that TD Garden is sort of putting up a stink because will a twenty like they? You well, know, I see Olivia Rodrigo at the stadium <laughs> exactly. instead of at TD Garden. I mean, but it all I, comes back to me. I guess what I say to that. And listen, I'm, I, I don't work at TD Garden. I, I don't know how it works. But, like, they do get summer concerts, so they would lose some summer concerts. But so many summer concerts are outdoors anyway. Like, how much are you actually going to lose over the course of it? Like, there are bands who like to play outside, and there are and bands, bands who, that do not, that do not yep. and only want to play in an arena. So you're going to get an I mean, it, like, that's like saying you might lose. Um, you're not losing concerts. And I know it's, it's similar in, in capacity size. But per usual, this could take 115 are, years yep. because there are a lot of people who are also And there's some environmental opposition. concerns, too. Yes, there, are there are some concerns. from the folks that are concerned about that area. But I have yes. to say, as someone who worked at KISS 108 that looked out at the Monsanto plant, um, I, you know, there are environmental concerns. You know, let me just uh, <laughs> uh, underline the most important point that was made by Trenny. It still has to be approved by the legislature. And we know how which, that goes, exactly. Jim. So, so we'll be talking about this next part. Can we do, uh, uh, Larry Lucchino died in a, oh, in a yeah. hugely important person, not only in the Red Sox resurgence after 84 years of a drought, 84, I think it was, but also- 86, wasn't it 86? 86, I think you're right. Changed stadiums around, I mean, yep. changed the whole sport. Here's a little sound from Lucino giving the keynote address at BU's 135th commencement. This is way back in 2008. Be bold, do be prudent, but please take risks in your personal life, in your career, in your travels, in your geographical choices. It was probably bold to assume we could move to Boston and acquire the storied Red Sox franchise in 2001. It was bold to conclude that even a gifted 28-year-old could quickly become a successful general manager. That's Theo. And by the way, Nancy Gertner went to Yale Law School with the Clintons and with Larry Lucchino. They were close, and we'll talk to Nancy, Judge Gertner, about him tomorrow. Did you know Lucchino? So I, you know, I met him in passing. I don't mm -hmm. even know if I ever interviewed him like one on one or anything like that. Because by the time I got here in 2012, I didn't really start covering the Red Sox uh, on a more consistent basis until 2013. And he was gone from the Red Sox by 2015. So there was only a really small little overlap. But I will say this: everyone that who did cover him said he was tough. John Tomasi, who is our Red Sox he's insider, fabulous. he's fabulous. Love Tomasi, yeah. Used to write for the Boston Herald, a uh, longtime columnist, longtime baseball writer. Used to have a radio writer. show. I him, did. He said, "Radio, which show. I listen to all the time." TNT. Uh, um, and he said, "You know what he liked about him was that he would push you, and if you asked him a question that he didn't like or what he wanted, he had no problem pushing back, and you had to really think on your feet with him. But like, it is you cannot argue, even if he was a little prickly and sometimes um, very vocal, um, sometimes got angry with people, um, a little over the top at times. People would say he got the job done. He was passionate about." It. And you could argue that since he has left, the Red That's Sox, he point. had John Henry's ear in a way that no one else did. He was able to go to him and say, no, you need, to, you need to spend money on this guy. And they haven't found anybody else yet, I think, that John Henry respects or will listen to in the but same way, way. Let me just say quickly, for those who didn't understand my reference, you know, the horrible old concrete parks. Camden Yards, uh, yes. which was the first of its kind, with Janet Marie Smith, is that her name, was the architect with him so at Baltimore Petco Field in uh, San Diego, and Fenway, even Fen though some yeah. of us still can't sit, fit in yeah, the like seats. If you, like if you the sit, whole re fix was him. If you sit in the monster seats, that was Larry Lucchino's yeah, yeah, yeah. idea. Um, I didn't know this, Red Sox Foundation, Larry Lucchino's yep. oh, yeah. idea. He, and afterwards, he's a, you know, a three-time, uh, tr battled cancer three times, also was the CEO and sat on the board of Dana-Farber mm -hmm. and the Jimmy yeah. Fund, um, you know, was extraordinarily generous. Uh, with his time, he also got Polar Park built mm -hmm. in Worcester oh, that's a great point, of course, um, yeah. when they couldn't come to a deal in Rhode Island. So his impact on baseball will be long remembered. All right, Trenny, thanks so much for joining hey, us. See, See, you at See you at the office. Warm up my lunch for me. See you at the final four. <laughs> Trenny Casey is the anchor and reporter for NBC Sports Boston. Coming up after the new news, Harvard national security expert Julia Kayyem is here. You are listening to Boston Public Radio 89.7 GBH live from the Boston Public library and streaming online at youtube.com gbh news
listening to Boston Public Radio with Jim Browdy and Marjorie Egan. Just ahead, more smart conversation about what's going on in our community. That's right after an NPR news break here on GBH News 89.7. Funding for our programs comes from you. And Compass on the Bay, an assisted living community in South Boston, dedicated to those with Alzheimer's and related dementias, featuring research-based therapeutic programming. More at compassonthebay.com. In anticipation of a total solar eclipse, follow scientists as they work to unlock secrets of our sun and teach us how to watch an eclipse safely. Catch Nova, Great American Eclipse, tonight at 9 on GBH2. Trusted. Local. News. You're listening to 89.7 WGBH, HD1 Boston, online at gbhnews.org. GBH News with NPR. What matters to you. I'm Jim Browdy, head on Boston Public Radio, live from the Boston Public Library. We talk with national security expert Harvard's Juliet Kayyem about the latest promotion of violence by Donald Trump and how nervous we should be or not be about avian flu. And it's Kyle Rose from the Civil Liberties Union of Massachusetts talking about what's at stake with yet another abortion case before the Supreme Court and a gunshot detection system that's drawing criticism in Somerville. I'm Sue O'Connell, in for Marjorie Egan, then acrobatics on the radio. Kai Bernard will perform here at the library ahead of her appearance in Hella Black Volume 6, and she's going to join alongside local drag star Killa Croc and show curator Amanda Shea. Plus, CNN's John King zooms in before we open the lines to ask you. Instant coffee? Instant ramen? Instant mashed potatoes? What is acceptable? And why not just spring for the real deal? All that and more on Boston Public Radio 89.7 GBH, live from the BPL. Live from NPR News in Washington, I'm Lakshmi Singh. In line with what other recent surveys are finding, the latest NPR PBS NewsHour Marist poll reveals an uptick in approval ratings for President Biden. But as NPR's Domenico Montanero points out, he's still lagging with key groups. Biden's approval rating is up to 43 percent. That's a three-point increase since the February Marist poll. His favorability rating is also the highest it's been in three years at 44 percent. Biden does well with black voters and college-educated white voters, but he's far below where his re-election campaign would want him to be with young voters and Latinos. 61% of voters 18 to 29 and 56% of Latinos disapprove of the job Biden is doing. Those are major warning signs for Democrats who need them to be on board come November. Domenico Montanaro, NPR News, Washington. Three of the seven World Central Kitchen aid workers killed by an Israeli airstrike in Gaza this week were British citizens, and their deaths are prompting calls for changes in British foreign policy. More from NPR's Lauren Freyer. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has called this an unintentional strike on innocent people. But UK Prime Minister Rishi Sunak says he is appalled. Sunak's office says he demanded in a phone call with Netanyahu a thorough and transparent independent investigation and described the situation in Gaza as increasingly intolerable. The UK has been airdropping aid into Gaza, but it also exports weapons to Israel. The possibility that some of those weapons may have been used to kill British aid workers in Gaza has prompted a growing number of British lawmakers, including some in Sunak's own party, to call for a halt to UK arms exports to Israel. Lauren Fryer, NPR News, London. White House National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan's postponed his travel to Saudi Arabia this week so he can recover from a cracked rib. Sullivan says it was a minor accident of his own. He was scheduled to meet with Saudi Arabia's Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman to discuss a major agreement that would include a historic normalization of relations between Saudi Arabia and Israel. A stubborn outbreak of bird flu continues to affect the nation's egg producers in the United States. And Pierre Scott Horsley reports on what that might mean for prices. The nation's biggest egg producer has temporarily halted operations at a Texas plant after bird flu was detected there. Cal Maine says it destroyed more than one and a half million laying hens. Company officials say there's no health threat associated with the eggs, but prices could climb higher. Egg prices already rose nearly 6% between January and February, though they're still down 17% from a year ago. Scott Horsley, NPR News, Washington. U.S. stocks are trading slightly higher this hour. The Dow Jones Industrial Average was up 29 points at 39,199. The S&P is up 12, and the Nasdaq has risen 49 points. This is NPR. 
Good afternoon. With the latest from the GBH Newsroom, I'm Henry Santoro. U.S. Senator Ed Markey chairing a field hearing that's in progress at the State House today on problems with the Steward health care system. The for-profit company runs multiple hospitals in Massachusetts. It's been under scrutiny for months over its troubled finances. Markey invited Steward CEO Ralph De La Torre to testify at today's hearing, but he declined. So Markey has set up an empty chair to mark his absence. He failed communities. He failed to show up here today to answer even the most basic questions about what he has done. Dr. De La Torre's chair is as empty as the promises he made to the public. Last week, Stewart announced plans to sell its network of doctors to a company run by insurance agent United Health. The results are in from yesterday's contentious town election in Canton. The race was animated by the Karen Reed case. Reed is the woman accused of killing her boyfriend, Boston Police Officer John O'Keefe, outside a home in Canton two years ago. The case has divided the town. Four candidates who've cast out on the investigation were running in yesterday's election, but only one ended up winning. Patricia Boyden was able to claim victory in her race for the Canton Select Board. Boyden and numerous others have questioned the charges against Karen Reed and given credence to poorly supported claims that police have engaged in a cover-up. Reed has pleaded not guilty with her lawyer advancing the cover-up allegations. She is set to go to trial later this month. You're listening to GBH News. Support for NPR comes from Drexel University, whose cooperative education program is designed to empower students to explore future careers and discover their ideal profession before graduation. More about experiential education at drexel.edu. Welcome to hour number two of Boston Public Radio. I'm Jim Browdy. So O'Connell's sitting in for Marjorie. Marjorie's back tomorrow. We're live at the Boston Public Library, streaming at youtube.com slash News. Ask the mayor. Uh, mayor Wu will join us next Tuesday from 11 to 12 here at the library. And I want to remind you again, today is also uh, National Library Giving Day. It's a one-day fundraising event to support your favorite library. Our favorite library, obviously, for self-serving reasons, <laughs> is the wonderful Boston Public Library. Yay. If you want to support one of the great hosts ever, I should say, David Leonard, his whole team, bplfund.org. One other uh, thing I want to advance, being set up right now is the stage for, I believe, what will be the first acrobatic performance on radio in American history. I think in world history. In yeah. world, world history. history. You can watch it either at the library on youtube.com slash News or couple of people, including Sue O'Connell, will narrate I will. Yes. the performance. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, again, I'm from Carney people, so I think I can history, do this, I think, so. history, <laughs> history will be uh, being made later in this hour. We're joined now by Juliet Kayyem. She's a former assistant secretary for Homeland Security under Barack Obama, faculty chair of the Homeland Security program at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. Her latest book is The Devil Never Sleeps, Learning to Live in an Age of Disasters. Hello, Juliette Kayyem. Hello. Hello. Hey Thank there. you all for coming out on this rainy, icky day. Good to it see is. you in person. You look great. Your hair looks great. <laughs> let's not, let's, let, I knew this. Do not get into help. this, please. <laughs> okay. Okay. I'm happy to bounce. Uh, okay, bounce. Fine. Okay, anyway. Okay, all fine. right, Thank so you. let's talk about the, the terribles <laughs> now, because you're here. We can talk about oh, yeah. some of the challenges. Yeah, you get the right? sports and the have fun yeah. and yeah, talk right. about like women's sports and everything's so great. And now here I Back to the Real world. Yeah, back so the real world. we were talking earlier uh, and listening and uh, hearing from our listeners around the World Central Kitchen um, incident that yes. happened in Israel. And, you know, President Joe Biden has expressed outrage, uh, saying that this conflict has been one of the worst in recent memories in terms of how many aid workers have been killed. Mm-hmm. This is a major reason why distributing humanita- humanitarian aid in Gaza has been so difficult, because Israel has not done enough to protect aid workers trying to deliver desperately needed help to yeah. civilians. Is that enough for Joe Biden? I mean, it's more than we had heard before. I mean, his, his, his uh, language is getting tougher on Netanyahu specifically and then Israel's war strategy. Uh, but, I mean, as we had talked and as you had referenced before, uh, you know, never before has the United States had to airdrop in food uh, 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 in, a, in a conflict as compared to sort of a natural disaster uh, uh, with a... With a um, uh, to overcome the opposition by our ally, an ally that we are giving billions of military aid to. Um, So can I just say something about this mistake? So first of all, um, 
uh, and what it means. So let me start with the second part, what it means. So we, we, we're seeing the aid uh, workers and the aid uh, community who are doing God's work and trying to get some food to the Palestinians, innocent Palestinians, uh, um, uh, stop uh, because they, you, if you can't protect your personnel, you really can't do it. It's just it's a, no matter how heroic the effort is, you just can't. And this was a caravan that was supposed to be protected uh, by the IDF. Had been told that they were protected. They had identification on the on the uh, on the car. But I want to go to the question of whether this is a mistake. Uh, you know, mistakes happen because the conditions for the mistake are set by leadership. And so Netanyahu cannot get out of this by saying, you know, war happens. The reason why this happened was totally predictable. It is a war without a mission. It is a slaughter uh, without any uh, care for the civilian population in, uh, in, uh, in Gaza. It is a war strategy that includes the deprivation of food to civilian populations. And it is a leader who will do everything, including not addressing the remaining Israeli hostages to keep this war going. And until we just start realizing, there's no mistakes in a war like this. This, is, this was set by Netanyahu in the war strategy that it happened. Maybe that's the mistake, uh, but it was totally Jose Andres used the term targeted, by the way. Yeah, he's, and he's, he's not an incendiary yeah. kind of person generally. Yeah. He does play it down the middle. He agrees with you, and obviously yeah. it was his co-workers who were... The one place I disagree with you, there is a mission. The mission is to eradicate Hamas. The issue is virtually every expert, including you, yeah. who I listen to, mostly on your station, CNN, including military experts, say, this ain't going to do it. And no, proportionality is not, a, yeah, is not, not a even a, a... And so the question is, how is that goal achieved, which it needs to be for the protection of the Israeli yeah. people, without killing tens of thousands of innocent Palestinians. And apparently and uh, uh, Netanyahu, at least as of the moment, doesn't give a damn right. what its greatest ally has to say. And in my opinion, Joe Biden is feeding, feeding yes. that he doesn't have to give a damn thing by giving him weapons, right. including and massive mean? ones with no conditions. Right. And, and, and even if I, even if Netanyahu's stated goal is to rid of Hamas, because I don't, I don't believe him, um, uh, uh, What's the metric for this activity? What's the metric of success? And that they've never answered. They've never answered. What is it? To rid yourself of Hamas? What does that even mean? What is that? The leadership? Is that 2,000 people? Is it, is it, you know, one Hamas for every 10 civilians dead? And that's, and so Netanyahu's been allowed to sort of just do these platitudes, like, like I'm going to get rid of Hamas. And no one's demanded any metrics of him, of what, what does that actually mean? I don't believe given the military action, that getting rid of Hamas is now the goal of this military action. You know, speaking of hostages, I just want to repeat, tomorrow we have two people with us, one of whom was on our show before, who was spectacular, Gilly Roman, who, Roman, who is, uh, had a relative, well, actually two people in an extended family who were hostages. He's going to be joined yeah. by his cousin, Maya, tomorrow. One of whom was released after 54 days as a hostage in Israeli, obviously. Another one who is still a hostage. And we'll get the same. As we said from the beginning, and I, I, I almost I don't know, resent, not the right word, that you even have to say this. Because other than lunatics like you know who, yeah. I hope everybody feels this. Two things can be true at once, as we've mm -hmm. said. Yes. The and horror, unimaginable horror visited on the Israelis on October 7th and still visited on the 100 plus hostages and the unimaginable horror yeah. visited on 30 plus thousand yeah. and uh, Palestinians, not to mention those who were on the board of starvation because of the deprivation of basic humanitarian yeah. and aid. Then, and then the workers, and then you mentioned all the aid workers mm -hmm. and the journalists. Yeah, the yeah. journalists. I mean, I mean, you, Roughly 200 of each, yeah, I believe, We've never killed, seen yeah. A, yeah. a military effort like this that is, tar that is targeted, use, your, use the right word, I don't know, that where, where so many journalists have been killed. It's just, it's... Can we come home and talk about violence, or at least violence incitement here? Yes. I, I know some people are tired of this, but it reached no. such epic levels in the past week. We've mentioned, I assume everybody has seen this either this video or this uh, photograph that was reposted by Donald uh, Trump of Joe Biden being hogtied in the back of a pickup with what appears to me at least and many this, the hogtide is clear the bullet in the forehead thing it appears to me that's what it is but it's unclear and add to that 
that, uh, to use an expression I hate, but we'll use, uh, John, Donald Trump doubled and tripled down, down. yesterday when he said, uh, Nancy Pelosi told me not to use this term, but they're animals. These yeah, migrants, the migrants are, are animals, animals. animals. Uh, uh, and it, it's so obvious to me, even if January 6th hadn't happened, that not the average Trump voter, who I have a problem with, but nevertheless, who, but those who pray at the altar of Donald Trump yeah. and are waiting for an order from the boss yeah. to do horrible things like they did on January 6th. You're an expert in this area. Yeah. What, what are these kinds of things, what do they provoke or potentially so, provoke in people? Oh, well, and, and, and part of this is, you know, uh, people's um, tolerance or, or willingness to, to utilize violence. So here's, so there is a pool of people who support Trump, a narrow pool. So not every Trump supporter is MAGA, not every MAGA supporter right. is violent. That pool of violent uh, people who is not insignificant, I mean, you know, is, uh, is, uh, is increasing the threat environment right now already. So we're looking at threats against public officials, looking at threats against uh, elected officials and others uh, uh, th that, uh, that will be activated, uh, will be uh, um, incited by views of that, of, of like what he showed of Biden and the language that he's using, like bloodbath, that he always tries to get out of, right? That, um, and so that's what we're anticipating. I mean, I think my first show here in 2024 is like, welcome to the madness. I mean, we cannot be surprised by this. We just have to be, uh, call it out. So I don't mind the, you opened up saying, oh, we're going back to this, go back to it. Because what is the important part is the pool of people who are going to realize that supporting Trump is supporting violence. Everyone's always been able to say, oh, there's Trump, the crazy Trump, and then, oh, I like Republican policies. There is no difference. The only way he wins the campaign strategy is the threat of violence, is violence or the threat of violence uh, uh, moving forward. And the question is, is how many, he doesn't care about non-white voters, how many white voters can he um, unify to get support for that, right? To get support for, for that image. And can they stay unified to overcome whatever votes well, Biden can put together? Well, if polls are correct, and uh, we've discussed with a lot of guests who yeah. say they don't believe them, he, is, he, Trump, is winning away not insignificant numbers of black, people of color. Yeah, yeah. Young black men in yeah. particular. Yeah. A majority of Latino voters, at least according to your station's <laughs> polling. Can I mention one more thing uh, 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 that is just so unimaginably horrible? If you're a member of uh, Officer Sicknick's family or yeah. any, any mm -hmm. normal person, a study was released last night on your station on CNN, I think by that Ryan Goodman guy yeah. from NYU Law, I'm not sure who did it. And they did an analysis of what Trump calls the J6 hostages. 93% yeah. of those who have pled guilty or been convicted of criminal offenses were against uh, law enforcement officers. 93% mm -hmm, yeah. yet there is nobody who plays more to that we are the party yeah. that cares about police and law enforcement yeah. than the guy who is saying he will pardon every one of the so-called hostages J6 hostages the day he takes office should he be elected. It's just unimaginable. I, I mean, the, 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 this most recent quote by Trump, the one that says uh, the United States will disappear, well, I don't know what his language was to this morning, uh, if Biden wins, he's surrounded by police officers in uniform. Uh, I don't know who they are. I don't know why they're authorized to do this. If they're federal uniforms, they're not authorized to do this. I, they, they, they might be state or county sheriffs are always, you know, the, the trouble. Um, and so that to me is a threatening use of your backdrop, That's right? That you're point. using the police as a way of saying, well, I'm going to enforce this through some public governmentally sanctioned. I believe, uh, unless I'm wrong, could you guys check, please? I believe the animals comment when he reinforced his position that he had migrants police are animals, I believe yeah, he, he was surrounded yeah. by police officers yeah. Julia, let at me, that particular Let me ask time. you how you talk to people. I, I have had um, a number of conversations with reasonable people who may be Democrats, maybe yeah. Biden supporters, and they will say to me, you know, you and the media keep making a big deal out of stuff that Trump says on the violence yeah. part of it. When people talk like this all the time, it's they say it in football games, they say yeah. it in basketball games, and I... You know, I was such a buzzkill one weekend morning where I said, okay, let's talk about where Trump launched his campaign. Yeah. 
Waco, Texas. Let's talk about what Waco, Texas means to people. Let's talk about where he had his first, you know, COVID. Yeah. Uh, Explain uh, what uh, happened event. in Waco, well, Waco Texas. Texas is the home of the supremacists. It's of course where, you know, the 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 um, what's the name uh, of the now you're now we're both having senior moments. Right, right. We shouldn't. But it's, you know, um, it's the it's where the, the federal officials went in. Right, and went a ton in of and kids killed. Were killed. Yes. Yeah. And why? How could we? But be it just mean, but it means so Not, much. You know, it means so much. And yeah. and when I break down these David these, this, David. Correct. 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 Yes, thank thank you. you very much. Whoever yelled that out. Start talking you. about the signaling that he's making. Yeah. That's not even a code. It's no, very it's clear. And then suddenly they look at me and go, wow, that's really disturbing. Yeah. I'm like, no kidding. Yeah. That's what we're talking about. Do yeah. we all have to do that? Yes. Is that what we yeah. have to I do? Mean, and, and, and to the extent that, that the explanation is that this, uh, that's exactly right, that this is not code. This is, there's like no, like everyone like, we stop saying it's a, it's a dog whistle. It's not a dog whistle. It's like it, there. It's Dinner, like the dog. Come in. It's like the dog. Um, yeah. and, uh, and that's what he's trying to do. Look, he has a strategy, right, which is, which is, you know, obviously the outrage, whatever, but I'm beginning to think um, and uh, that he also has a strategy for him losing, because I know the polls mm -hmm. are all over the place, but there is also another sentiment that the polls are not capturing Dobbs, and that whenever mm -hmm. you put Dobbs and abortion rights on the ballot, which the White House is surely to do, and Florida has made it a little bit easier, um, uh, as, as as Alabama, uh, that the ladies get out. And when the ladies get out to vote, they, they tend, even the independent ladies will, will vote uh, Democratic. So. What, wherever the polls are, I t I'm thinking about this now that he's got a way to win in terms of galvanizing people, terrifying people, or making them like, oh, God, you guys are talking about that again. And he's setting up the narrative for the loss. Like, I think we have to be as prepared mm -hmm. for Biden winning uh, and what that violence means. I'm not joking. I mean, no, I, 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 the Trump yeah, is not going away. And the hilarious thing is that the Republicans who had the opportunity, as I said a million times, Hello, to Mitch make McConnell. Trump go away, Mitch McConnell, the senators, uh, the Atlantic um, uh, uh, has a story on the sort of profiles and cowardice, how the senators have just sort of folded uh, to Trump. They could have stopped this. Um, that uh, that um, th this is for uh, the Republicans. Uh, Dream on if you think he's going away in 24, 2024. You know, Dream on. And he could be leave, alive in 2028. Like, after all Trump, we know, this, you know. Can I recommend another piece that I recommended the other day that I reread last night? Adam Gopnik, who we've yes. had on the show from The New Yorker, we're trying to get him again for next week, wrote a piece that's a review of a book uh, about. Uh, uh, let me step back. I've said this a million times too. In the first few years of Trump, anybody who called and made a Hitler reference, I cut him off respectfully. Right. I don't anymore. <laughs> Read this piece. And we're not talking about what Hitler did to the Jews. We're talking about the rise of Hitler. The rhetoric and Read the Read Adam Gopnik's piece about the parallels between, between. the rise of Hitler yeah. and the rise mm -hmm. of uh, re-risen uh, Donald Trump. And uh, it's, it'll re it's really powerful. And again, we hope to have him next week. So avian flu. They're killing chickens, they're whatever. And I, I was sort of, I mean, I don't want to say chickens killed, but we talked about Corby this in a different way with young male chickens being killed on day one, which is just horrible, but that has nothing to do with anything. Uh, 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 there's one case in Texas, as far as I know, but when I read the story last night, it, 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 I want to be careful when I say yeah. this. It is, let me not say pandemic, epidemic, pieces to the story. So I guess the long, I shouldn't have gone this long, but how worried should we be about this? I'm not worried. Oh, okay, well, let's, let's move, move on. on. <laughs> okay. No, no, no. I mean, I'm, not, worried? I'm worried about for the avian population. I just think that there was like, one bat in, uh, yeah, in wherever like, it was. Yeah. I mean, I follow like Helen Branswell and the stat team and stuff like that. So I basically judge everything by these, what, what, what the very smart reporters in this are doing. There's reason to be worried. We've, we've got to um, isolate uh, this strain uh, there might be uh, circumstances that I can't even explain that you would have the, the bird to human uh, transfer, but they're not seeing it in other humans. I'll, I'll be worried next there week. There is a human. One, there's, just uh, one. There's always, right. there's always one. There's always one. <laughs> There is Look, always remember one. when Trump's, I'm sorry, to, I don't want There's to scare only, people. Trump said, oh, there are only 10 cases. It'll yeah, be gone in right. a week. No, I know, I know. But, 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 but it's been identified early. You isolated? have isolation, isolated. Oh, okay, so, okay. so it's like the Ebola person. Are you, yeah. are you worried? So, so I'm, I will, I will, let me take back my, I'm not worried. <laughs> what are you? Conditionally not worried. Okay. And I, and I will be back here in a week. If I'm in a mask, 
<laughs> you will know that I started to worry about this new avian flu outbreak. You know, the good news on this front, since you're doing a horrible job of allaying the fear, I'll try I to know, allay I, the fear no. that I created. <laughs> apparently, unlike the beginning of COVID, when we were ill-prepared, there are apparently Lots. zillions Zillion. of vaccine doses yes. mm -hmm. for avian flu, so that even if it became two yes. or four, we're ready Yes, for this that's, I mean, that's, that's the, 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 the both, we know the virus, uh -huh. it's not a new virus, and that it's, it's early detection is the only way to, to get at this. So that's why, you know, yes, this one, this one case can be worrisome, but of all the things to worry about right now, is that, is that a fair way of putting it? That's all actually the things, correct. Okay, like all the things to worry about right now, this is like eight. Got it. <laughs> All right, let's stay on the worry. Can we stay worried? <laughs> this me getting home in this rain is That's like number be one. By the way, do you hear what the next day or oh, so I don't is going to be it. like? It's yes. unbelievable. April. But it's not going to snow in Boston. Everybody knows this. It's going to oh. snow in the whatever we'll it is see. around 495. Who yeah. said that? I said. Oh, you we'll said see. it. We'll, we'll see. see. We'll, we'll see. We'll see. Yeah, we'll okay. see. All right, Juliet. Yeah. Uh, speaking of worry, um, terrible earthquake. In, yes. In um, Taiwan, right? And they are super uber prepared for. Yes. They yeah. are always and still, you know, nine dead, lots of destruction. Um, so I'm going to bring this back to me, of course. I get mocked all the time because I have in my car window breakers and um, thank you very much. I'm going to high five. I have, I have, I have window five. breakers, but I, that's because I have like an irrational fear. Yeah, that I, came have, I have a go bag at home. I've got all, you know, you once made fun you of me. You need to hang out with me though, because I wouldn't mock you. I would like, I would say right, good job. Right, but I also, you made fun of me once because I didn't have my license plate um, memorized. That's one of my favorite moments with Julia yeah. Kaimor signing in. She goes, what's wrong with you? You don't know your license plate. You have it in your phone, right? Yeah, I did, but that's I could memorize yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I, you know, I, I have um, in the car um, phone numbers written on a piece of paper. Good. In case of, what are you talking about? I'm just saying, like, at what, what's the right level of preparedness? Oh. I mean, is you know, d again, we look at Japan yeah. really, really well prepared and, you know, stuff. Taiwan, uh, yeah. Taiwan, Taiwan. rather. Yeah. Sorry, Taiwan. That's okay. Um, what... I mean, I always be? tell people, like, you know, there, there's basics. Like, what, what are you going to care about when this thing happens? It's going to be your family. So do you know how to connect with them? Do they know what to do? Can you contact them? Do you, uh, can you walk home if you have to? That's going to be the most important thing. Everything else can wait. But if you want to do more, then it's that the 72 on you, which is, which is uh, uh, you know, three days of provisions if you, if you can and if you want. I mean, I'm not going to, you know, it, it would be helpful because then you're, you know, not calling, waiting for <laughs> someone to come help you in the case of, say, an earthquake. We don't get earthquakes here. And 72 on you is just the terminology is sort of three days that you can just take care of yourself. Are you like a prepper? No, the 72 but is see, not this is prepping. What I'm it's having. Like, so I tell. say this in the office, and uh. I and immediately someone goes, oh, so you're a prepper. No, I no, said, no, yes, I prepper, I know. prepper is long periods of time in isolation. So let me tell you. So I'd like to check out your basement, <laughs> yeah. by the way, yeah. is all yeah. I can say. You live nearby, so I you do. could. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, um, I have been checking out yeah. your basement, so by like the way. Ten, that's, that's so him. there's this like thing, it's like 10 meals until anarchy. So the idea is if you can satisfy yourself for nine meals, you're fine. And then the 10th meal, we're all we'll all go to anarchy. But I just want to say one thing about the window thing yeah so every people who know me know everyone's allowed like sort of one irrational fear oh like, my, I can't like wait. no <laughs> yeah so but now my irrational fear happened which is my irrational fear was i i i i i have a very calm persona like publicly i literally start sweating driving over bridges oh. i have this fear fear yeah. that I am in a car and the reason. bridge collapses. Yeah. So I do have a window thing. There's no way I could survive it, right? Like, you, you know, it's like the metal and everything, you're going to die. But I was like, I feel better. I can get out of my window. Like, well, let me thing. give you an example of this. We and have... guess what happened? Whoa, oh, sorry. What? Baltimore. Yeah. Oh, of course. Like, I, then I was like... Well, let me tell you, the other day, right the day after Baltimore, uh, the governor was on the show. And Marjorie and I, before the show, were talking about the fact that there's nothing quite as terrifying is driving across the Sagamore Bridge. Yeah, and again, yeah. we're not trying to scare people, but come on. When you get to the top of the bridge, and you can't, it's sort of like a Ferris wheel, and you can't go anywhere because it's backed up, and you look over the side, and you see it was built like 700 years ago, <laughs> and it's on the whatever, uh, uh, not debilitated. What's yeah. It begins with a D. Structural deficit yeah. list. And I, deli well, not deli I'm sorry, Zoe. He's always saying dilapidated, <laughs> whatever. Uh, uh, and we asked, uh, we asked, and we were, we both freak out every time we drive over it. We asked Mar Healy if she was nervous 
uh, when she drives over the Saginaw River. Now, obviously, if you're a governor, yeah, you, you have say to no. say no. Right. Do you think she's nervous when she has well, to drive over the Saginaw She's got those state police. Yeah, they get good. everyone <laughs> off. Of course, she's not nervous. They, they get their own lane. Do you know who would never drive over the uh, Tobin Bridge? Who? What? Angela Menino. Come is that on. True? Uh, yep. That if someone is... can fact check me. She would that... where they whenever How would she get to they would have to go all the way around. She's going to East Boston or someone, they would they would have to go all the way around for an appearance. She one okay, of the reasons she didn't so... do a lot of East Boston appearances is because they had to go all the way around to that get her there. Crazy. So since you mentioned Angela Menino, this has absolutely nothing to do Can I just I... interrupt you for one you second? May. The jugglers are stretching behind you. They're not you. jugglers, they're acrobats. Acrobats, acrobats are, are yeah. behind you and it's acrobats on radio. So well, do you know who Jenny, they're so do you know who dumb. Jenny the Juggler is? Yes. Jenny the Juggler is, she's actually a fairly frequent phone caller. She, I believe, four or five years ago, standing exactly where you are, did the first juggling performance oh. on radio in American in history. And I think we're about to have the first <laughs> acrobatic un- experience. So I mean, I'm going to tell one quick answer. Okay. Can I tell a quick answer? Oh, yes. Yes, sir. The only reason I'm telling you is because I was out to dinner the other night and a person at the next table said hello and said, I heard you once talking about this video. GBH did a half hour documentary a hundred years ago on Tom Menino when he was running for the city council. Mm-hmm. And there is the most charming scene in this. He's in his basement and he has, you remember, uh, I don't, most of you, well, some of you are old enough here, you used to have these little uh, portable TVs that rested on like a wire stand mm-hmm. kind of yeah. thing. So Menino running for city council has his introductory announcement speech on top of the portable TV, sitting on the couch listening as Angela Menino and her best friend. And I hope this is, I mean, this is a hell of a build up for whatever. (laughs) In any case, so he's doing his speech and he says, and I pledge to you that I will fix the physical condition of our community. And Angela, without looking at him, says, Tom, it's fiscal, not physical. <laughs> it was just, it was a great, was a that great worth moment. telling? Yes, no? worth yes. telling. Definitely thank you. Love, we love the build-up. And build it's a great documentary. You're just being nice, but no, thank you for great. doing that. Yes. I appreciate it. We love the build-up. By the way, I, th- I don't there, know if you can find out. The car is no longer king. You should Google The car is, is no longer king. king. Blame the woo all you. you want for bike lanes. It's what him. is my point? Oh, I think if you Google <laughs> GBH News and Menino and City Council, you can. it's a charming, wonderful uh, doc, you have anything more to say? I don't. That's it? <laughs> okay. That's rare. I really, I really that is don't. really rare. <laughs> you can't say for the acrobats? I, Acrobat. I, she, she's incredible. You were, you're she incredible. Said this no, she said this is She said she's Kai, unbelievable. You are, un- I mean, what you're doing with your body is like, you know, I, I, I like literally Kai, I'm we can't up. hear you, but I'll repeat your answer. Has any acrobat ever, ever performed oh, there on she radio is. There she before? Is. Yeah. I'm she sure. says, I'm not sure. I am sure. Yeah. The answer I'm is sure. no. I'm sure. Look at that. Are you going to be in that She's rain? coming up yeah. uh, in a very short uh, period Julia, of time. Julia, people would that. like you to print your, um, publish your go bag information okay, somewhere. Okay, good. I will. I will. After I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm joining her on the ring. Okay. Did you know that? Yeah. So lollipop I, something. She'll explain I it to us later. I cannot wait. All okay. Right. There, she's we're like, done with Juliet. Do okay. Right. I ran out of things to say because. We won. The acrobat has stolen the show. So thank you so much. You did win. It's very nice to see you. Thank you. Kyan, Former is. Assistant Secretary for yep, Homeland Security under Julia President Kyan. Barack Obama and the Faculty Chair of Homeland Security Program at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. Her latest book, The Devil Never Sleeps, Learning to Live in an Age of Disasters. Up next, American Civil Liberties Union of Massachusetts Executive Director Carol Rose. You're listening to Boston Public Radio 89.7 GBH live from the BPL and streaming online at youtube.com slash GBH News. When four branches of the military centralize their medical services to cut costs, troops and their families notice, especially if one of them is an army nurse. I was seeing the results of families not having good access to care. Um, And then my husband started having seizures. I'm Mary Louise Kelly. When army hospitals downsize, that story on All Things Considered from NPR News. Today at 4, here on GBH News 89.7. Our programs are made possible thanks to you. And Tanglewood, the summer home of the Boston Symphony Orchestra, bringing Beethoven, Broadway, and more to the Berkshires. You can plan your summer at tanglewood.org. And Owens Corning of New England, 
helping homeowners create living space using the Owens Corning Basement Finishing System for over 20 years. More information at ocboston.com. Welcome back to Boston Public Radio. I'm Jim Browdy, Sue O'Connell sitting in for Marjorie. Marjorie returns to action tomorrow. We are live at the Boston Public Library, streaming at youtube.com slash GBH News. Mayor Wu joins us next Tuesday at the library. It's April 9th from 11 to 12. And the next, our next guest has the misfortune. The only thing worse than following an acrobat <laughs> is preceding an acrobat on radio and delaying the performance. But you're a brave woman. I think you can handle it. She's Cal Rose, executive director of the Civil Liberties <laughs> Union of Massachusetts. She joins us regularly. Hey there, Carol. How, how are you? Great to be here. Hi. How are you? Nice Good to see you. you. And I just have to say about that acrobatic thing, yeah. I thought it was like a torture device. I was going to do some <laughs> sort of an ACLU intervention. <laughs> So is I this free speech or are you being oppressed? <laughs> Which one is it? <laughs> All right, Carol, it's great to be here. We've Thanks. been talking a lot, obviously, about the Mifepristone. Um, Thank you yep. for me to say. Thank uh, you. And the Supreme Court. But there's yeah. also this other yeah. issue, this other case that I haven't paid attention to. I hadn't to. heard about Jim it hadn't this heard morning. It either. Yeah. So educate us on what else we should be paying attention to. <sighs> oh, my gosh. There's so much going on around reproductive justice issues in this country. And, um, you know, we have the Mifepristone case that was just heard in the U.S. Supreme Court. And then we have the two Florida rulings that just came out yesterday uh, on the state court level. And then now we have this emergency abortion care case that's going to be heard by the Supreme Court this on, month, uh, April 24th. Yeah. yeah, that's when the arguments are going to be, and we'll probably have a decision in June sometime. Uh, but this is really awful because this is a case in Idaho where Idaho passed a law that basically told the doctors they have to disregard this uh, bill, which is the Emergency Medical Treatment and Labor Act, EMTALA. Law, not bill. This, I'm law. sorry, a it's law. A law yeah. This is a 40-year-old law that basically says that if somebody comes into an emergency room in dire need of care, Doctors have to provide that care. Um, it's a pretty basic thing. And the Idaho legislature is trying to say that, no, uh, you cannot do that. You cannot treat women who come in uh, needing care, whether it's like miscarriage, because it might lead to an abortion. And when you think about the fact that 15% of all people at some point in, during their pregnancy go into an emergency room because they need to be checked, there might be something going wrong, and now doctors and physicians in Idaho would be criminally prosecuted um, if they provide that emergency care. So the life of the patient is on the line, the doctor's um, professions are on the line, and as a result, doctors are leaving Idaho 20% of OBGYN doctors have left Idaho since this law went into effect. So the argument is that even if you're in a state that bans or virtually bans abortion, the federal law requiring you to give medical care supersedes whatever your state law is. Right. You have to provide emergency care if you're an emergency room doctor. And, you know, I just have to say, this one hits home for me personally, because I had a very good friend who had an ectopic pregnancy, you know, the, the, in her sure. ovaries, and she died because she didn't get the care. And I think it's really important to realize we're talking about millions of people whose lives are on the line here with all of these efforts to you know, ban or restrict abortion. We're not just talking about the law, we're talking about actual human beings. What's the argument for? I mean, I, I, exactly. I, what, what's the argument that they're making about why this should be okay? Because they're just sort of like, abortion is wrong always, anti-abortion extremists, not realizing that this also affects miscarriage care and other kinds of reproductive health care. So the idea is that if you threaten the doctors and say, we will criminally prosecute you if you follow this federal law, then the doctors are in a bind. And what they do is they leave. And hospitals are shuttering their OBGYN boards. And so access to health care, reproductive health care, and maternal health care is going to go down or is going down in Idaho. As why, as why is this guy? I mean, I, Mifepristone was on the tip of everybody's tongue. We learned, or at least I learned, 63% of abortions are actually through medication. That's right. But uh, I had not even, as Sue said, I had not even heard of this case. Now, obviously, it doesn't apply to quite as many people, right. potentially. But why has this been so under the radar? Do I, think? I think mostly because the court just agreed to hear it in late January. Oh, okay. so it's just oh, it's sort well. of the court just took it up. So it's only now coming onto the radar screen for a lot of people. All right, but it's really dangerous, and it's part of this pattern across the country of trying to restrict access to health care for women. So I listened uh, intently to the Supreme Court arguments. Um, was it? I don't even know when it was. Last week? Yeah, a week couple before. weeks ago, March twenty sixth. Yep. Um, and I, I have to say, I on I, Mifra Yes, mm -hmm. yes, and. I, I, I came away with some feelings and some opinions, and I know I'm always um, don't like to answer when somebody asks me what I think the Supreme Court is going to decide because it's uh, no Especially winning. Especially this court, right? And, yeah. Um, but what was your takeaway from 
from the arguments? And, and, and was there anything that you heard from the justices that led you to think that they're just going to kick this one and get rid of it and say, we're not addressing it? Yeah, I think there's at least a good chance we can hope um, that they are going to kick it and not, t and not do anything on it. And so this is a case. Um, basically, it's a challenge uh, by a group of a handful of doctors um, who say that they don't want to have to perform uh, abortions if somebody comes into an ER having taken medication abortion. Now, the, the mifepristone, this drug that we're talking about, it is used in 63% of abortions, and it's safer than Tylenol. It's safer than Viagra. Right? It's been so around I mean, for 30 years. It's been around for 30 years. It's unbelievably safe. Um, and these doctors who filed this lawsuit in one zone in Texas where they knew they'd get a Trump judge that would take it up, um, they're trying to challenge the FDA approval process of, of mifepristone. And the problem with that is multiple. But what the court really focused on was whether these handful of doctors actually have what's called standing. In other words, I can't just go into court and say I'm mad about something. I have to be personally affected by it. Um, and so these doctors, none of them have ever been called in to do this. This has never happened to any of them. They don't actually have a grievance that affects them. And if they did, hospitals right now, there's a conscience clause. And if a doctor says, I can never do anything involving uh, abortion or reproductive health, the doc then, and because of my religion, the hospitals have to take that into account and make sure that there's coverage in other ways. So, so to put a finer put on, on this, that. what I, I love about it is that the, basically the argument they were making is that this hasn't happened to me but. And it probably won't happen to me. Correct. But I would like the Supreme Court to protect me from something that is never going to happen to right. me. Right. By making it impossible for anyone across the country to use medication abortion. And so it's, it's, I think the court didn't buy it. And so that was the first thing. I mean, even Amy uh, Coney Bryant, uh, Barrett and others, and, and um, Roberts and Gorsuch, like all of them really got hung up on this standing question. Yeah. So I think they're going to use that as a reason not to take the case up. However... Uh, Justice Thomas and Alito uh, invoked what's called the Comstock Act, um, and they seem to be wanting to go on that. And that would—that's a 150-year-old law. One of these. Um, well, the U.S. mail. Yes, we can't. You can't send contraception or abortion or anything like that, abortion medication through the mails. Um, but that would also include on in cars or trucks or any other place um, across state lines. And nobody thought that was a law until after Roe v. Wade fell. And Dobbs came in, and suddenly now it's being, uh, they're breathing life into that ugly old law. And so this is part of the effort by the anti-abortion extremists to try to get a nationwide ban, not have it be state by state. You know, uh, uh, let me tell you, uh, let me proceed what I'm about to say by saying my powers of political prediction, and I'm not being falsely modest, are atrocious. <laughs> Having said that, it is so obvious to me what the Supreme Court's going to do in this. This is a court that doesn't believe in the freedom of women. So what do you do, because it really, I mean, let's face it, all these, you know, Steve Breyer, God bless him in Cambridge, you know, it's not a political court, whatever. Uh, uh, it is a political it court, a political and, court. and the reality is they decide what the outcome is supposed to be, and they figure out how to get there. So they say to themselves, if after the repeal of Roe v. Wade, if four months, five months, four months before the election, we uh, uh, basically strike down use or crossing state lines of Miff Pristone, right. Joe Biden's the next president of the United States. I'm comfortable saying that that would propel him to the presidency no matter what Trump does. So here's what I am convinced they do. They knock out the case on standing. Yep. On a technical Until reason. after November. Mm -hmm. Then the anti-reproductive uh, freedom forces find people who will have standing. They're probably taking one of these guys out to dinner in their million dollar <laughs> yacht, you know, hundred million yep. dollar yacht. And yep. they say, what will get, get a standing? Here's what will get a standing. They file the exact same case with proper standing. And the majority of the court strikes this down too post-election because the impact will be, and not on women, the impact on the presidency will be negligible. Isn't that a reasonable no, scenario? I, no, I think it's, and I think the most important thing you're saying is that the, the people who want to try to get a nationwide ban on access to abortion and miscarriage medicine are not going to stop, or to access to abortion and miscarriage and contraception. They're not going to stop until they, get an, until they get it across the country, impacting places like Massachusetts as well. So that's why it's really important that we fight back each step of the way, including here in Massachusetts where Governor Healy has done great work to make sure that mifepristone is being stockpiled. Um, there's an abortion. Yeah, but let's say again, as we said to Governor Healy, even though it's being stockpiled, I think 15,000 doses, if the court does the wrong thing on this, at some point the 15,000 doses are going to run out. Right. And that law will apply to Massachusetts. So what, I, what I've heard, and this is, I think, this perhaps one of the more troubling scenarios is that people are still going to get access to abortion medication. They're just going to have to do it illegally. There's going to become an underground market. And we'll go back to the battle days when people died. Um, because if people 
are forced, are so, their circumstances are so dire that they can't bring a pregnancy to term. They will find a way. Uh, and there are other ways that it's going to happen. So what is only going to happen is it's going to make it more dangerous uh, and it's going to make it more women's lives, more people are going to die because of it. This you know, might be a little, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry, in the okay. weeds, but the drug mm -hmm. was originally to treat ulcers. That's correct. Oh, I actually saw an SVU episode on it, a, Is like it? A, an old one five years ago. Right. Is um, that Marjorie's show? No, it's my show. We, no, we had a guy from, a girl from the North Country on the other day. She didn't give a damn that he was a performing girl from the North Country. They cared that he had appeared in one, one episode, episode of, everyone's of appeared SVU. In one, SVU. And was, but if, if it gets banned... Does it get banned for use for what it was originally designed for? I mean, the, the, my understanding is it was a side effect. I don't think. I think it goes back to what happened before they changed the yeah, rules. Yeah, so you could yeah. still. So a lot of people could have ulcers. Right, and right, and you're going to see, and point. also misoprostol, which is the other medication, yeah. uh, abortion, which has less yeah. efficacy and is more painful, will still be available, and that's available in every veterinarian's office. So unless I think you know, people, a lot of these people who apparently don't care about. Uh, women's lives care about their pets. Yeah. You know, uh, this is a question for which you're not prepared, so feel free to say, I'll tell you next time I'm here. Have Alito and, and Thomas ever ruled on a case that benefited the majority of people? I, I'm totally serious. Mm. I, I forget 9 nothing, where they're so yeah, over... On a, on a case where there was a divide, have they ever ruled in a way that, that benefited the majority of the American people? Jim, nothing comes to mind, but I'll look into I it. I mean, it's really, it no, is it's a on, mm -hmm. on every question you read, even when the New York Times, the Washington Post, read a near unanimous court, what's the next paragraph? Alito and Thomas. Right. Alito and Thomas. It's just, it is really, where are you, by the way? I know you're, you, you don't do politics, except in your real life, but not in your job. We were discussing with Judge Gertner the other day, he's going to be with us tomorrow. There's a growing movement, not huge, but some, that uh, Sotomayor, Justice Sotomayor oh. resigned before uh, the election, so Joe Biden at least has a a, an opportunity to appoint a successor because one of two things, or both things could happen in November, Trump in the White House and or Biden in the White House, but with a majority Republican Senate, which would cause him not to be able to ever have a justice like Sotomayor on the court. What do you think about that? Um, well, again, the, you know, we don't, the ACLU doesn't get involved in that, but I would say that I, I'm really hesitant to have that happen because I think they would find a way to try to block whoever That's Biden's going to bring into too, case. Yeah. So I just don't, I don't trust, yeah. I don't trust the, the extremists enough to think that that's a good idea. We're talking to Carol Rhodes, head of the Civil Liberties Union of Massachusetts. So Carol, one of the first things I learned about the ACLU as a, as a youngster was that sometimes the ACLU takes up <laughs> the cause of someone who I might disagree with and that's the whole argument of the ACLU and um, the Supreme Court is hearing a free speech case. Mm -hmm. uniting the NRA, the National Rifle Association, and the ACLU. Um, what's it about, and, and does this happen more often than we hear about? No, it doesn't happen very often, and when it does, it's... Um, news. News. <laughs> uh, so I just want to say for the record that the ACLU doesn't support the NRA or its mission or its viewpoints. Um, but this is a case where we have to put principles before popularity. Um, this is a national ACLU case, so the ACLU of Massachusetts hasn't been involved in the case. Um, however, um, I think it's really important, because this is a case about whether the government in New York can use its power to try to uh, warn people about providing financial services and other things to the NRA, to any nonprofit. And, and the principle at stake here is whether an enforcement agency can sort of use both the power of its enforcement combined with telling people not to do business. And that, on its face, you may go, well, if it's the NRA, that's great. But if New York can do it to the NRA, then Florida can do it to Planned Parenthood. And Texas can do it to immigrant rights groups. And, you know, Kentucky can do it to the ACLU. And other groups could do it to WGBH. So what you want is a situation where the government can't use its power to try to uh, combined with enforcement action. So if it's just a letter, an advisory letter saying just, you know, words alone saying we don't like this group, that's one thing. But if it's we don't like this group combined with and we're going to have sanctions against you if you do it, that becomes an onerous use of power. So this is a case where we put principle over popularity. But I do think it's important to understand that the ACLU doesn't support the NRA or its viewpoints. When, that, when something like this happens where you, you decide the principal, again, is more important than, the than who the client is, which I hope most people would celebrate, 
does the ACLU lose supporters and oh, gosh, funding? Yes. And so Absolutely. there's a cost. There's for a this. there's a huge cost to it, and and I understand it. Um, but I also really think that it's important to recognize that we don't always choose what case is going to go to the Supreme Court. We, didn't, we weren't in this case before it was being argued in the mm -hmm. Supreme Court, right? It was only after it was going to be mm -hmm. argued in the Supreme Court. And you have an opportunity in the highest court in the land to try to make good law or prevent bad law from being made in a way that could really be used to undermine lots of other nonprofits whose views we do support and agree with. By the way, the other side, just so we're fair here, is suggesting that not, they weren't uh, 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 pushing anybody do anything they were voicing the government authorities were voicing an opinion and if you the civil liberties union representing the nra is successful here it will basically shut down the ability of public officials to voice an opinion on yeah. a whole yeah but i mean that's that, I know, that's no, their that, argument no and that is their argument but but in this in the facts of this case that's not what happened mm -hmm. it was combined with enforcement actions and meeting with lloyds of london and all sorts of other things mm -hmm. so if you actually look at the record it's pretty um fact intensive, and the ACLU is arguing if it were just speech by the government, that would be a protected bonus. With speech combined with other enforcement actions, then it becomes silencing of a nonprofit. Do you want to say a third time that the Massachusetts chapter has nothing to do with this case? <laughs> I want case? to say for a fourth time, the Massachusetts <laughs> chapter has nothing to do with this case. Even though you support your national organization, I always support the national you organization. Jordan Cowrose, who's head of the Massachusetts version or <laughs> arm of the Civil Liberties Union. You know, there's, there's a saying about the ACLU that if you agree with the ACLU 80% of the time, you're probably an ACLU member. If you agree with the ACLU 50% of the time, you're probably a board member. <laughs> so there you go. That's actually I like it. That's a pretty good line, pretty good I line. should say. Yeah. All right, let's look uh, somewhere here in our backyard over in Somerville, of yeah. course. Um, you know, something that I think people on the face of it, the shot spotter sensors, think, wow, what a good idea. Uh, the sensors hear uh, a, a shot from a gun, a rifle, or a pistol or mm -hmm. something, and immediately tells the police department, and the police can immediately respond, don't have to wait for someone to call in or think it's a backfire or right. any of the number of things that people may think. Um, but we're finding uh, that there's research that shows that it's just not an objective sensor, that uh, although the device is, how it mm -hmm. is used is impacting communities, uh, black and brown communities, unfairly, they're saying. And what is Somerville, what's their reaction to this? Mm -hmm. And we should say there are, I think, um, over 150 towns or cities in Massachusetts that use these Including Boston. Yeah, mm -hmm. shot spotters. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, I agree with you. On, on its face, it looks like, wow, this looks like a good police tool, right? And so, who would be opposed? But in fact, uh, what we have found and what multiple, multiple studies have shown is that these shot spotters tend to create false positives. So there'll be a, a car backfiring or a garbage truck or you know, a fireworks or something, and the police will go rushing in. And what's happened many times is then they've falsely arrested somebody or they've even shot young person. There was a 13-year-old boy who was shot in Chicago because of this. Um, and it doesn't work. It hasn't made anybody safer. So there's a study out just from the Journal of Urban Health of 68 metropolitan counties um, from 1999 to 2016 and found no reduction in homicides, no reduction, no increase in murder arrests or weapon arrests. Simply, it just doesn't work. Um, but what it does do, because of where they place these secret uh, say on cameras, if you would, um, they're putting them into black and brown communities. So the false positives tend to have a disparate impact from a racial perspective. And so what looks on its face like it could be a good thing turns out to be a bad thing. And in Somerville, because Somerville is one of the few communities in Massachusetts who has something called civilian control over police surveillance, CCOPS ordinance, um, when before they, they can adopt a certain technology and after they adopt it on, on an ongoing basis, they have to report whether it's working or not. What are the impacts on civil rights and civil liberties? And the good thing is that Somerville City Councilor Willie Burnley introduced an order to actually withdraw ShotSpotter, the authorization for ShotSpotter, because it's shown that it doesn't work and it does make people uh, put people in danger. Well, isn't there a third piece of this that someone le they don't the ShotSpotter, whatever the name of the organization that owns it, mm -hmm. doesn't disclose for I think decent reasons mm -hmm. on its face where the things are, so it doesn't leak to people who might be able to move them or right. whatever that somebody leaked where the locations were and overwhelming the locations where they put them are in communities of color, exactly. even if the objective facts about crime don't suggest that that's where right. they should be. Exactly. So, uh, so we see the deployment of them in a secret and racially disparate way, um, the negative impact that they have from false positives, and simply the lack of utility because they don't actually help. And they're very expensive.
It wasn't, by the way, Somerville, uh, your colleague, Kate Craw uh, Crawford, who's mm -hmm. brilliant on yes. this technology stuff, was with us when uh, you guys were fighting the facial recognition yep. stuff, talking about how racially discriminatory mm -hmm. and how inaccurate it often uh, was, particularly when it came to people of color, black people in mm -hmm. particular, I think, including members of Congress identified that's as right. mm -hmm. felons, even though a lot of them are felons. But that's all. <laughs> not that, those, but that particular not, ones. Not, not those, those particular ones, ones yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. That was my point. Uh, uh, but, uh, and Somerville, I think, was, was that the first community to actually outlaw facial recognition yes. technology? Yes. It's sort of odd, it's the same community. You guys, is it fair to say the Civil Liberties Union is not crazy about uh, high tech? Uh, uh, crime fighting. Is that a fair or is that an unfair charge? No, I, I, I don't think we're opposed to, I mean, we're not the Luddite society, you know, we're not okay. opposed to technology. It's just the technology has to actually be shown to use. And too often we think whether it's algorithms or uh, facial recognition technology or shot spotters, that somehow technology is infallible. And in fact, the human beings are still in the loop on all of whether we deploy them, mm -hmm. even in shot spotter, how we respond to them. So you're not getting the humans out of the loop, but there's a false sense that technology is somehow neutral or, uh, mm -hmm. or perfect. And in fact, it's not. Um, but a lot of the things that we've done, I'll tell you the most important one, and my late wonderful colleague Sarah Wunsch won this case in 2011, was the right to use your camera to film the police and their performance yeah, of their public huge. duties. And if we didn't have that, we wouldn't have had anybody filming the George Floyd murder. We wouldn't have had anybody filming, um, you know, Ahmaud Arbery, all these other kinds of things that in fact have helped us to have more accountability yeah. for police. So I think it's important to see technology isn't always good or always bad, but how we deploy it really matters from a civil rights and I imagine the data. I mean, if the, the if the if the shot spotter isn't actually helping them to solve who get right. and, and respond more quickly, mm -hmm. it could be argued that from the privacy or the the uh, unfairness of it is irrelevant if you're spending money on something. Right, and that's, that's why not working. And Fall River, like Chicago, just recently said they're not going to invest in it anymore because it doesn't work and it's expensive. And that's our tax dollars used for something that doesn't do any good and might do a lot of harm. All right, Carol Rose. It's been a pleasure, Carol Rose. Are you sticking Thank around you. to watch the acrobat? <laughs> Absolutely. I would not miss this, by the way. And by the way, it's not just the acrobat. It's a whole deal here, and that'll be part of it uh, coming up very soon. Thank you so much. So thank you so much. Carol Thanks. Rose. Carol Rose is the executive director of the American Civil Liberties Union of Massachusetts. Coming up, Hello Black is back. It's sixth iteration through uh, Boston Center for the Arts. We're going to talk to curator Amanda Shea, plus drag queen Killer Croc, and acrobat Kai Barnard. You're not gonna wanna miss this, especially our play-by-play -play of what happens. First time in the world ever. It's Boston Public Radio 89.7 GBH live from the BPL and streaming on youtube.com slash GBH News. Americans are losing faith in college. They're worried about the cost and uncertain job prospects. I'm Kirk Carapeza, and I'm headed back to school to ask some hard questions about the business of higher ed. In our podcast, College Uncovered, we'll talk admissions, junk fees, debt, what happens when schools close, and everything in between. You can get a peek behind the Ivy yourself. Listen to College Uncovered wherever you get your podcasts. Support for our programs comes from you. And Upstart Logic, founded in Silicon Valley in 1998, committed to helping CEOs and their teams diagnose and solve intricate problems, cultivate leadership, and develop company culture. Learn more at upstartlogic.com. And Liberty Mutual Insurance. Liberty believes progress happens when people feel secure and exists to help people embrace today and pursue tomorrow. Learn more at libertymutual.com. I'm Nicole Garcia, producer for BPR, and you're listening to 89.7 WGBH HD1 Boston, online at gbhnews.org. GBH News with NPR, what matters to you.
Welcome back to Boston Public Radio. I'm Jim Browdy. Sue O'Connell sitting in for Marjorie. Marjorie is really going to be sad she missed this. She'll be back tomorrow. We're live at the Boston Public Library streaming. Marjorie, you can watch it if you're listening. YouTube.com <laughs> slash GBH News. For this next segment, you're really going to watch on YouTube if you're not lucky enough to be here. I've been waiting for this for days. Mm -hmm. On Monday, April 8th, performers in the annual Black Arts Showcase, Hella Black, take center stage at the South End's historic Cyclorama Theater. Here with us at the interview uh, desk, local drag sensation, Killa Croc is here. Hey, Killa, how are you? I'm good. How are you doing By today? the way, my parents almost named me Killa, but they decided not oh to. That so would have been so awkward. It would have been really names. awkward. And I had the exact same outfit at home, but that's a whole other story. Next interview will. As is the show's curator, who is here, who also happens to be an award-winning spoken word poet, and host of Outspoken Saturdays, right here at the GBH BPL <laughs> studio. Amanda Shea, Amanda, it's great to have you. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you for having me. And I don't mean to denigrate anybody else, the most important guest in a second who's <laughs> going to join us, maybe for the first time ever on the radio. Let's hear for Kai Bernard. She'll showcase some of her acrobatics for us live at the library on something. We'll figure out what it is. A lollipop uh, lira. That's what, whatever. That's what that thing is. And by the way, for more information about the show on April 8th, Hella, H-E-L-L-A, Black, Volume 6. Go to bostonarts.org. Amanda Kill, it's great to have you. Thanks so much for being here. Thank, Thank you, you for, for having, having us. us. Thank you. So, Amanda, tell for the uninitiated, what is Hella Black? Hella Black is liberation, freedom, our stories, our journeys, our experiences. It is a platform for all of us black artists here in Boston to celebrate our joy and tell our stories. And can you tell us about on the 8th, it's not just Killa and Kai, there, what are there, seven? Uh, There's nine altogether. Oh, nine, okay. Yes. Well, give us a little sense of, because we'll learn about Killa and Kai in a couple of seconds, what else is going to be happening on I the I think 8th? people are going to expect the unexpected. <laughs> um, there's so many different mediums here that's going to be happening at the show on April 8th. I'm really, really excited. I've been trying to keep mum, but I will say there's going to be dance, storytelling, um, Hip hop, R and B, poetry. There's going to be so many different art forms, and again, expect the unexpected. There's this is a full production, and we're really, really lucky to have partners like Illuminous with us as well to help us light up the light up the stage. And Kill, I want to I want to talk about um, the the scene right now, especially the drag uh, scene. And of I, course. And what I love, Jim and I were talking before the show, and Jim was talking about the danger of being a young drag queen drag person coming out and I said yes because the older drag queens and kings are also very difficult sometimes in the community as a you know we've we've I'll all been the there for that one yeah. <laughs> I'm just kidding I'm just but kidding. I wanted to talk about the community as it is today you know years ago uh, there were only a few places you could go to experience the art of drag mm -hmm. now it is both a lot of places you could see it but there's also a lot of risk that goes along with it what's your experience where, where how would you report the scene today I will say that the scene, and I, I want to say that I'm very lucky and fortunate that I, I started drag just a year ago, and I've been fortunate to be able to perform essentially all over Boston mm -hmm. and the New England area. So a lot of drag performers, especially new drag performers, they perform at Jacques Cabaret, mm -hmm. which is a legendary um, drag bar here in Boston. So hey, Jacques Cabaret. <laughs> um, but the scene, as you mentioned, it, there, is a lot, there are a lot of drag queens, kings, and things. Um, with the Avenue RuPaul's Drag Race, there are more performers, but not as many performance spaces, especially because there are a lot of performance spaces that are being closed down, or there are, perf there are some clubs that don't really see the value in drag, so they don't have us perform as much. Or so. some of the venues are worried about these neo-Nazi lunatics, like out in JP, outside libraries. I mean, it, it, the environment is really tough, you know? It's tough, but one thing about the drag community is that we all, even though we may not all know each other, we are all going to have each other's back. Mm -hmm. So I've been very fortunate to be part of a drag family, the House of Calypso. Hey, House of Calypso. <laughs> and to actually become a community member within the drag scene. I know I have a lot, of, lot to go, but I'm very fortunate. I'm very fortunate. Okay, so Amanda is really secretive about what's happening <laughs> on the 8th, but we have one of the performers with us now. That would be you. Yes. What are you doing Monday night? 
So I'm going to be performing, I don't know if I can say, but I'm going to say, okay. say it. Okay. I'm going to be performing a Dreamgirls mel melody because something that is sacred to me is Dreamgirls. I love the original Broadway soundtrack. I love the movie with Beyonce, wearing Beyonce right now. <laughs> Hi, Beyonce, if you're not watching this. But, <laughs> I think she is. She actually, is, she, yes. is. she is. But like, it is one of the... It's, my type of drag is Park and Bark, so I love to just give emotions, show face, and just give a show to everyone. So I'm excited to do that on Monday. And yeah, hopefully y'all all enjoy. Hopefully everyone in this audience will be going uh -huh. Period. April 8th. <laughs> do, you want to, do you want to promote any other organizations or venues you have any connection to or not? Ooh. Okay, think about that for a minute. <laughs> Amanda, before you, you guys introduce uh, Kai, uh, uh, you do these Outspoken Saturdays thing here in conjunction with GBH, including, mm. I think, this Saturday is one, yes, right? Yes, April 6th. Tell us a little bit about what they are for people who are unfamiliar. Outspoken Saturdays is a beautiful platform for emerging artists to come up on the platform and perform poetry. Um, when I say emerging, it was initially for emerging artists, but I feel like there's a sense of, like you had said, with the kings and queens, and it's important for us to ensure that it's intergenerational, that there's poets all over the city that are all age ranges, all different types of levels of experience, and they all should be highlighted. So Saturdays is really dedicated to giving a platform to the poets in this city of Boston for them to perform their art. And we have eight performers each Saturday um, that come in and share their art and their hearts. And we also have panel discussions as well. We had Shauna Bryant for International Women's Month speaking on her journey of just being a woman here in the city, city of Boston, trying to put on the open streets and all of the work that she's done and all the entrepreneurial things that she has um, stepped into. Two to three. Yeah. Two it's, to three yep. on Saturday, right? It's two to three, two to three okay. every first Saturday of the month. And, and it's obviously, packed. it's, packed. it's we National Poetry month. Month, yeah, it's been, month, too. It's been great. So. Okay, so Thank who wants to explain? And Kai is going to join Killa up here in a couple of seconds. But who wants to introduce what we're about to see? Do you want to do this, Amanda, or do you want to do it, Killa? It's up to you guys. I feel so. like Amanda, you're okay, curated Amanda, this, what, so what are we going to see here? I'm just going to live my life up here. Please <laughs> put your hands together in a big round of applause as we welcome Kai, who will be doing this aerial performance for us here at GBH Studios. Give it up, give it up, give it up. Let's hear it for Kai. number of what seemed to be death-defying. To us, they Woo! would be. Yes, yes indeed. <laughs> Honestly, if you're not watching this on YouTube, you are seriously missing out right Amen. now. Amen. And if you're listening now, you can go to YouTube later and watch it, so you won't be so worried about missing out. Her movement is so effortless. It's like air. Yes. Oh, my God. I wish so I was that flexible. Describe that. The I mean. strength, the flexibility, the grace, the presence. You need all of those things. Wow. Oh, my God. Gravity defying. A split upside down. That is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> With no hands, by the way, a Woo! split upside down. Hi, Bernard. Unbelievable. Yes! yes. Definitely go to the YouTube channel to see it later on if you're listening on the radio. And Kai is going to join us, correct? Yes. And while we're waiting for Kai to join us in a second, I don't want to diminish what Kai just did. I did that exact same performance last <laughs> week. Uh, right before we... That was un it's unbelievable. unbelievable. What do you think of that, Kelly? You want to give us a little review? Honestly, 10 out of 10, five stars. <laughs> you, if you want to see more of that, come to Hella Black on April 8th. Seven to nine. I cannot do that. I would try to do a split, and I would be in the hospital for a month. So. Kai, that was fabulous. Kai, that was really fabulous. Not even out of breath. 
How long have you been doing that kind of thing? <laughs> um, I've been doing it for about seven years now. Yeah. And, and a I am out of breath. 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 <laughs> <laughs> and for the people who were unwise enough not to be watching, what is a lollipop lira? What does that mean? So lollipop lira is a freestanding pole with a giant circle, giant hoop on top. Um, it's stable. We got it situated together so that way it wobbles with gravity, wobbles with your movement, and um, it's comfortable to work on. <laughs> what, what, what's the, the, the artistic mission for you when you're doing this? Because it's not just, it's not just acrobatics, right? It's, not, it's a story that you want. It's something you want to tell us about yourself through this art. What is it? Oh, wow. The story is just to show that once you find your passion, fall in love with it, and there's going to be so many ups and downs, but you keep pursuing it mm. and allow the journey to unfold for yourself. Try not to let it consume you. Try not to let it consume you in a negative way because life is going to throw you all those things to sway you from it, and that's how you truly know it's your passion. So that's what I try to pursue with that. How welcoming is the, that world? That world? Is it okay to call it acrobatics? Is that So what, this is aerial what, arts. So aerial arts. Circus world. It's how welcoming is that world. to people of color? Um... It's sort of in the middle right now in New England. There's not a lot of black aerialists on the scene. Mm. Um, it's sort of dominated by predominantly white people. Um, so it's Why a little tough. What, what, what causes you to say, this is what I want to do? Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> I have a dance background, and the dance world became a little toxic for me. Um, just, like turned into like eating disorders and stuff like mm -hmm. that. So I took a break from that. And then once I found circus art, and once I discovered that I could push my body, keep it safe, and like challenge myself. And in that sense, it's like you have to fuel yourself to be able to lift yourself like this. So it sort of just helped me to like push through to keep on doing cool things on it. <laughs> By the way, we should say this is all, both of these performers are going to be part of Hella Black at the Cyclorama on Monday, April 8th. You go to Boston. We're not done. Go to mm -hmm. bostonarts.org to uh, find out information and get tickets. Kill it. T talk to you about the space, you know, the Boston Center for the Arts and the Cyclorama. Um, both of you would... would Before you continue, Shakir watching on YouTube a post, dang, let her breathe a little. <laughs> Sorry, we will, Shakir. Well, she Apologies. just had such self-control. <laughs> <laughs> Is it really? I think it, oh, that's great. I posted it to my family group chat being like, come watch me, so... Go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I'm she sorry, definitely sir. had the self-possession that she wasn't breathing heavy. So <laughs> there's it. But talk about the space of the cyclorama and what it, what it adds to what you do. So, um, I was able to, I think it was last week or the week before, um, we were doing video um, clips for Hella Black, so I was able to walk into the space for the first time a few weeks ago, and it is huge. Yes. I'm so used to this little <laughs> rinky-dink bars with a little stage and people drinking, not really paying too much attention, well, unless I'm performing, because I'm great at what I do, uh -huh. but, <laughs> thank you, um, but I'm, it's such a huge space, so I am excited to see how my performance can take the space, it is beautiful, natural lighting. I mean, it's going to be happening at 7, so we won't get all mm -hmm. that natural lighting. But it's a huge space, so hopefully I see you all there. And you, you talked about the community of aerial arts and circus arts. And I think, um, I know when my daughter was in elementary school some 15 years ago, there was a traveling uh, group of educators who came and did circus arts. And they, they, they did a show, and it was amazing. Um, how much of this Americana tradition that has been, I think, part of our country forever. Is it, is it resurging now? Is it getting more respect? It's, 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 you know, you say the word circus and people think certain things, but at the same time, it's an exceptionally elegant and beautiful art form. Mm -hmm. I think it is coming up now and people are beginning to realize that you know, it's available to the public. It's happening now. A lot of artists, like celebrities, they do have like polars during their tours. And um, at Beyonce, she had an aerialist on her tour when she was here in Gillette Stadium. So whatever happened to her, by the way? Yeah. I, I'm, 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 I'
<laughs> yeah, um, I think it is coming up, and I think people are beginning to notice the world of aerial art, so it's really exciting. You know, by the way, Killa, while you're uh, relatively new to the drag world, as you said, from February of last year, you've already gotten some decent recognition. My under yeah, you're smiling. Tell people <laughs> about it. Look at you. <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing is, like, I am, as I mentioned, like, my experience in drag is not like a lot of other drag performers here in the city, so I'm, I'm very fortunate to have been able to perform at Jacques, to be performed, to perform at, like, Le Legacy's Night... Night Ooh, I'm yeah. nervous, y'all. Sorry. <laughs> Legacy nightclub. So I've been able to perform, especially with my house, the House of Calypso. Um, we've been able to, me particularly, been able to perform in a lot of venues within Boston just to get a kind of a particular style of drag that isn't seen as much nowadays, like the Park and Bark. Um, Describe oh, wow. for people what that is. So the Park and Bark. So the Park and Bark is legit. Um, usually it's a slow song where you do the lyrics and you're just giving emotion you're giving feeling you're just you're trying to connect with the audience in a way that isn't just like dancing it is just like you're trying to get them to feel something get them to feel an emotion get them to feel the performance so and a lot of queens nowadays are more dancing and I love a dancing queen I just cannot do a split like that I cannot but um, well you're standing next to someone who might be able to help you yeah, yeah. Okay. right there I'll start stretching right now <laughs> Can I ask you one last question, Kai? And I'm, I'm sure I'm just projecting. Uh, but are, are you scared when you're doing, when you're like upside down in a split and you're not holding on? Are you, is there fear in you or have you moved past that? Um, I feel like a good explanation is, remember when you were kids and we would just climb everything. We'd climb trees. We wouldn't expect anything of it until essentially you fall. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so you sort of build that tolerance um, as an aerialist where, yeah, it is scary, but you push yourself more, you get a little higher, you hold on a little longer, and then, and then you realize, like, okay, it's not that scary. I've built the strength. I've built the confidence. And... And that's how you sort of Plus go through Plus, you made it, yeah. history right here. <laughs> yeah, there you go. We believe, until we're contradicted, mm -hmm. the first right acrobatic exactly. performance yeah, for back on the radio <laughs> doesn't get much better in ever oh, in the world. So cool. It was great to meet you guys and Amanda as well. Lots of luck on Monday night. We urge yeah. everybody to join you. Thanks Thank so much you. for Thank being you here. So Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. We've been speaking with drag queen Killer Croc on Instagram, at Killer Croc Drag, acrobat and educator Kai Bernard on Instagram, uh, at the Flying Yogi. No G, and uh, curator of Hello Black Volume 6, poet and host of Outspoken Saturdays here at the GBH BPL studio, Amanda Shea. So if you need more information to make sure you get there on Monday, April 8th, you can go to bostonarts.org. We're going to take a quick break, change some gears here, and talk with CNN's John King. You're listening to Boston Public Radio 89.7 GBH, live from the BPL and streaming on youtube.com slash GBH News. I'm Arun Roth. Coming up on GBH's All Things Considered, Senator Ed Markey is leading a hearing on the failures of Steward Health as the for-profit hospital operator continues to face financial peril. The Governor's Council is expected to vote on Governor Healy's blanket pardon for misdemeanor marijuana convictions. And new numbers show that the state's March revenues were better than initially expected. Those stories in all today's news, starting at four on GBH's All Things Considered. Support for GBH comes from you. And Newberry Court, a full-service retirement community in Concord, Massachusetts. Newberry Court is committed to creating active, independent lifestyles for persons 62 and over. More at NewberryCourt.org. And Comcast, offering the Xfinity 10G network, designed to provide a connection for home networks so everyone can be online at once, even during peak hours. Xfinity.com. Welcome back to Boston Public Radio. Jim Bradley, Sue O'Connell sitting in for Marjorie. She's back tomorrow. We're live with the Boston, she being Marjorie's back tomorrow. We're live with the Boston Public Library, streaming at youtube.com slash GBH News. 
Uh, ask the Mayor, uh, Michelle Wu joins us next Tuesday here, April 9th from 11 to 12. And we are obviously back this Friday as well. We're joined by a guy who doesn't do traditional acrobatics, but deals with <laughs> political acrobats all the time. On Zoom, he's CNN's chief national correspondent, John King, host of All Over the Map and the Battleground Reporting Project, tracking the 2024 campaign through the eyes and experiences of the voters who will pick the next president, which has been nothing short of spectacular and created great insight. John, it's great to talk to you. Thanks so much for joining us. You don't, you don't think I'm not Dorchester's premier acrobatic dancer? Uh, well, you were I smiling. No you look like answer. you could do some of those moves, John, because you're like, not. oh, I know that. I no, can do that. We does. saw that. All right, John, let's, let's jump into uh, it and talk about the issue we've been talking about uh, all morning, uh, both with our listeners and with our guests, the World Central Kitchen um, attack that uh, happened and the, the reaction to it. We've talked to folks who have, and I've, I've said it feels like a turning point uh, to some degree, even though you would hope there would have been turning points before, um, Joe Biden calls it outrageous, uh, the strongest language he's used thus far, but still some think not strong enough. What are your thoughts on it? Look, you just see how difficult this challenge is for the president, uh, both on a policy and a political level. Uh, politically, there's no question this issue is hurting the president. Uh, it's, it, he has a lot of cracks in the Democratic base. Uh, and in the battleground states and younger voters and Arab American voters and a lot of other voters. I, I, you know, maybe we shouldn't you know, compartmentalize it so much. I think this is a big issue for a lot of progressives, a lot of voters, period. Um, from a policy standpoint, you're absolutely right that the president's language is getting tougher. Um, and I, after the, this, you know, Israel says it was a mistake. Netanyahu says they'll try to figure out how to not let it happen again. Uh, but you see the president uh, getting angered, yet at the same time, the administration is going ahead with a big sale of F-15s to Israel. Mm -hmm. uh, and they have not stopped weapons transfers uh, to Israel. Uh, and, and so those who would cheer, uh, largely progressives, but again, I think it's broader than that, but those who would cheer the president's tougher talk about Israel needs to do a much better job. We need to get much more humanitarian aid in. Uh, Israel needs to be a whole lot, I won't use you know, choice language, but that's essentially what they're conveying in private, we are told, uh, of more caution and care in their planning. Uh, people who might see that and say, finally, Mr. President, are probably then going to look at the arms sales, F-16 transfers, F-15s, I'm sorry, uh, and say, well, wait a minute, you're playing two sides of the street here. Uh, and that's what gets really complicated from a policy standpoint because of Joe Biden's personal career affinity and, uh, and support for Israel and the, and the broader U.S. support for Israel. We're talking to John King. By the way, for whatever it's worth, as we are speaking, Politico is reporter, uh, reporting that, quote, angry Biden will not change our uh, weapons-related policy vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Israel as a result of this uh, World Central uh, Kitchen thing. You know, John, I, I wasn't just blowing smoke, as they say at you. Your ability to get the reality out of real people who are often not crazy about talking about to reporters is unparalleled. One of your recent, last time we talked to you, you're on your way to the border, piece on CNN, what these Arizona voters see at the US-Mexico border that national politicians do not, what did you learn and what's the answer to that headline? Uh, well, the answer is that, and I find that you find this everywhere, but you think about how intractable the immigration issue has been for so long. I mean, back when I was covering the Clinton White House, that's how long ago people said they were going to do something about this. And then I was covering the George W. Bush White House uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, what you find, and this we found in just crystal clear terms right there along the border, is if you put, you know, uh, 20 average Americans uh, in a room, uh, they'd figure out 60% of it pretty quickly. Um, you know, and then they'd come back in a week and try to deal with the rest of it without... Um, calling the other person evil or un-American. Uh, these are people who you ask them, you know, where should we go for lunch? And they tell you to go across into Mexico, you know, from Nogales, Arizona into Nogales, Mexico. Sonora uh, is the Mexican state. Uh, and they're used to doing this. It's a community, they're neighbors, they're neighbors. It's like, you know, Brookline and Boston. Um, it's like Newton and Waltham. You know, where do you go for lunch? You go back and forth. In this case, there's a border wall between it now. Uh, and their biggest complaint is, and you'll have you'll have very liberal Democrats who say, I'm okay with the wall. I didn't like the razor wire that Trump put up there. I think that's sort of demeaning and it makes it looks horrible aesthetically, um, but they're okay. They want more border security. Um, they want more agents because they want the wait times. It's their, their, their livelihoods, their economics depend on it. And then their personal recreation sometimes, wanting to go somewhere for lunch or go see a friend just south of the border. Uh, so they want more border security. What they don't like 
is when Trump particularly demeans Mexicans and demeans immigrants. Many of them are of some Mexican relation themselves or descent themselves. And if not, uh, those are their friends and neighbors and customers. Uh, and they don't like it when they see some liberals saying you can't give the Border Patrol any more money you know, because it's a police state. Um, and what they say is, uh, why don't you guys come and meet us and understand our economy and understand how important this issue is to us and we'll figure it out. They, they hate the shouting. They want to have a conversation about these issues. They understand they're difficult. Um, they would agree that there's a border crisis, uh, but they don't scream and demagogue. They talk about solutions, not slogans, I think is the best way to put it. And again, they would if you just put them in power for 10 minutes, they'd figure ha- at least half this stuff out pretty quickly. I know there's not a monolith, but here's uh, one person you interviewed who was uh, voicing an opinion as to who would uh, get her vote come the fall. Here's John speaking with Faith Ramon who used to smuggle migrants over the border, but then got caught, was convicted of a felony, and now her voting right uh, is being restored. Ramon is now an activist who registers voters and is eligible to have her own voting rights restored. Her first choice for president would be this November in Battleground, Arizona. I will vote for Biden. Donald Trump is not an option. I don't like the fact that our reservation was destroyed by a racist wall. I understand everybody's got their own opinions and obviously their own personal experiences, but did you discover any trending kinds of things in terms of where people most directly affected by issues around the border are going to be putting their confidence come November? Well, well, Faith has a unique experience and, uh, uh, you know, to be candid, it was thrilled. Our, Our producing team found her and we met her. Uh, we don't spend enough time with indigenous Native Americans. Mm-hmm. Um, they're viewed as sort of a fringe constituency in American politics. Um, the Tohono O'odham tribal lands in southern Arizona are the size of Connecticut. Um, oh. you know, this is not a small piece of property we're talking about here. A- and again, you know, if, if you're somebody else somewhere else, you might say, I want the wall. The wall will stop the illegal uh, immigrants from coming across. The wall will show a border and America needs to have a border. I get all that. You know, that that's fair political debate. For these tribal lands, for people who were here before there was a United States or before there was a Mexico, mm-hmm. um, and their traditions are, you know, that's our magical spring and that's our sacred shrine. And they used to walk back and forth, and now there's a wall in the way. And what used to literally be a five minute walk, Jim, can be a six hour trip because you got to go to a border crossing and you got to go through and then you got to come back. And so, you know, you can disagree with that if you want and say, I'm sorry, the, you know, the tribal lands are on the border and we need the wall all the way across. But one of the things you learn when you actually respect people and listen to them and let them air their side of it is you just, you know, uh, these are these are good people. Her story is remarkable because you're right. She had a substance abuse problem. Uh, and the way to get, she said, easy money was for years. She used to tr- smuggle illegal, illegal immigrants inland from the border, mm-hmm. you know, inland into Arizona, where they would then make their way into the country. And then she got caught. And she said, you know, a felony conviction um, put her on a path to sobriety. And she's a different human being now. John, is this your conversations, um, you know, you're you're pointing quite accurately to the majority of people who, if you ask them questions about how the government and law should be run, many of them actually have answers to it. It's like that movie Dave, you know, where the accountant ends up being in charge of the and is able to run, get the budget fixed for the the government. Um, And it discounts or I don't want to say discounts, but it, it, it de-amplifies the yelling about things, whatever the issue is. Um, do, do you leave a little more hopeful after talking to people that we spend our time listening to the amplified voices and you're talking to people who are having actual lived experiences and giving you practical, common sense answers? Yes, uh, I do leave more hopeful. Um, I, I try to remember where I'm from. Uh, you know, I grew up with seven kids in Dorchester, a very blue collar family. We didn't have much money growing up, but my mother taught me a very important lesson early on. Um, it often was predicated with a shut up. Um, <laughs> the, the, lesson, the lesson that came after that was that, you know, you don't learn when you're talking. Um, you learn when you listen. Uh oh. And so we're just learning. We're learning so much. We just we're learning so much from getting out there now at the same time, um, you know, these most of these voters, and again, whether it's the ultra Trump supporter to somebody who's left of Bernie Sanders, um, one thing they share, Sue, is a, is, a, is a disaffection, a disappointment, a disillusionment. Pick your word for it. But that Washington, like, what's wrong with these people? Uh, think about the last four or five years of American life: COVID, inflation, AI, uncertainty, 
all this economic, you know, turbulence in the air and social turbulence in the air. Uh, but every one of them, just like you two, have to get up and go to work in the day. You know, have to get up and go to work, figure out, you know, whatever it is, whether it's, you know, how do I get my kids to school? How do I do this? How do I do that? Get the car, get the car fixed, figure out the new commute when the green line breaks down again. Um, you know, you got to people have to do all this stuff and they look at the politicians and they're like, all they do is scream and shout and raise money. Uh, and they don't see anything getting done. So you're hopeful when you talk to them because they're amazing, hardworking people. Uh, but they're profoundly disappointed uh, with their capital. And I think in my lifetime, Washington has never been more disconnected from the people it governs. And I mean that on a bipartisan basis. So, uh, John King, we've talked a lot uh, the last couple of days about some decisions from a high court in Florida around abortion. We've just been talking about the border, which seems to be the major issue that uh, the Republican candidate for president is focusing on and the major issue that the Democratic candidate, the president, seems to be focusing on is reproductive freedom for women. We've talked about this six-week ban being approved, but it seems to me come November, the huge thing is the fact that there will be a ballot question, one, allowing marijuana be legalized recreationally, but much more significantly in Florida, uh, putting uh, constitutional rights on abortion uh, uh, on the ballot before the people to decide. And Sue and I were talking yesterday about the value of uh, banning same-sex marriage ballot questions when uh, George W. was running for re-election in places like Ohio. Uh, I didn't realize Florida was this close last time, 51.2% for uh, Trump over Biden. Could the people that are drawn out by that ballot question make what is a trending red state, uh, Joe Biden state in November, do you think? Is that possible? I think, yes, it's possible. I, I, I think it's a fascinating question. Now, by reflex, I'm skeptical, right? Because Florida um, has been, yes, that narrow margins, but has been consistently red in the last two elections. Yeah. Plus, if you look at the state Democrats' performance in Florida over the last decade, it's been pretty miserable. Um, and, and so, you know, party infrastructure doesn't matter as much as it used to. Um, but if you look at the, you know, just the past 10 years of political life in Florida, um, you know, you, you know, as a Democrat, you don't put a lot of money on that table. However, then look at the last, you know, two years of American life since the Dobbs decision, and whether it's Kansas, a red state, or Michigan, a purple state, everywhere this issue has been on the ballot, everywhere it has been on the ballot, uh, it has benefited abortion rights forces. And, John, uh, my, and so is it possible? Yes. I mean, I, look, listen, I think in this election year, especially with the third party candidates and depending on which states they get ballot access, I say rule out nothing. Pay attention to everything. John, is it your experience um, that these victories where um, abortion has been on the ballot, the victories for the Democrats or those supporting um, safe abortion access and care, I, I always feel like it's not bubbling in the polls. And I don't mean the national polls, but just, I, you know, when I'm reading the coverage leading up to these votes, it always seems that the local press is a bit surprised that it happened. There's always this like, look, it's, it's, it happened. And I keep thinking, there's this huge number of mostly women, I think, who aren't talking to anybody, who are just showing up and voting um, for their best interest. Is it, is it actually surprising to people, or are these people who are voting for, uh, for the Democrats just not being talked to, or are they not speaking up until they vote? Well, I think it's complicated in the sense that until the ballot initiative is before you, mm. a lot of people don't pay attention until it gets late. Um, you know, so if they ask you what's bothering you today, you might say inflation, or you might say I'm mad at Biden about Israel Gaza, or you might say I'm mad at the thing that's in the news or the grocery bill you just paid. Uh, but then you walk into the voting booth, you know, and you see that on the ballot, and you're like, oh, wait a minute. Um, number one, number two, I. I Listen, I, I, I just think keep an open mind about all these things, but just look at the empirical evidence again, you know, um, and and look at the math. Women are 53 percent or you know, have been in the past of the electors, not just women, uh, but that's a pretty good place to start. <laughs> if you got 53 percent that you're trying to win an election and 53 percent of the electorate are women uh, and, and a large chunk of them are are concerned about this issue. And, and I also just say quickly, it's not just, you know, uh, people who support abortion rights. If you look at Kansas, there are a lot of people out there who are more moderate or even conservative on the issue who are like, wait a minute, you know, Washington, get out of, Washington should not make this decision. Judges should not make this decision. This is hard, this is personal. Um, if we have to make this decision, let us make it here at home. 
Um, and so there, it's, it's, it's complicated, uh, but the math is self-evident of what has happened, different coalitions in different states. And so if Florida is another one, uh, you bet, you keep your eye on that. Again, you know, it's recent history says be a tad skeptical, but then again, look at everything that's happened since the Dobbs decision. You say, well, maybe I shouldn't be so skeptical. Let's watch and count. You know, John, I ask you a variation on this question almost every week, so let me apologize in <laughs> advance. Yesterday, with law enforcement personnel surrounding him, Donald Trump, yet again referred to migrants as animals, sort of proudly saying, despite the admonition of people like Nancy Pelosi, they are animals. A few days earlier, I was going to say even more egregious, I don't think he can get more egregious, uh, he uh, reposts an image of uh, Joe Biden hogtied, and I think this part is debated, there's not, no debate about the hogtying, it appears to be a bullet hole in his forehead, but let's assume there is or there isn't. In either of those circumstances, is there any Republican of consequence who has publicly said this is a line that even Donald Trump should not cross or is it the same m quiet fealty that they have always shown? Oh, I'm sure over time there may be one or two who do it, but um, you were just very kind to play a little snippet of the piece I did last week. Um, if you had a leading Republican uh, calling Donald Trump out on this, I hope you would play the sound and give that Republican credit. Yeah. Um, for saying, can we please debate things within the lines of decency? Um, and so, no, I, I've used this term before. In most cases here, you have the grand ostrich party, as I call it. They just stick their head in the sand um, and they just hope nobody asks them about Donald Trump, most of them. Um, a lot of them, you know, um, somehow laugh at when he does these things or think it's amusing. I, I do think this is a giant question going forward. Look, if the election were today or tomorrow, um, all the data tell us, New Wall Street Journal swing state polling today, yeah. um, that Donald Trump would win the election if it were today or tomorrow. It's not. It's seven months from now. Uh, and as the American people see more of that, uh, you know, there are issues that work in Trump's favor. Immigration, crime, people have a nostalgic memory of the pre-Trump COVID, pre-COVID Trump economy, mm -hmm. if you will. Uh, but does his tone, and again, we're talking in the margins, right? Does his tone if you're the black voter in Milwaukee who's mad at Joe Biden and th thought maybe the economy would be better under Trump, when you hear that stuff, you're the Latino voter in Nevada and you hear that stuff about migrants, um, you know, seven months is a long time. And I think that is that is the risk for Trump. And the, the dynamics of the election right now are not good for the incumbent, right? Take the names out of it. This is a yeah, bad yeah. to be an incumbent. Um, and so the, the underlying dynamics are good for Trump, but he is his own worst enemy sometimes. And I think the two examples you just gave um, you know, Jim, how many times do we have the conversation? Well, when they get in a room and they tell him he needs to stop that, you know, maybe <laughs> stop that, right? Yeah. How many times have we had that conversation since 2015? You know, and, and maybe, maybe you get 12 to 24 hours of, you know, the new Donald Trump. Um, so I, that, that to me is the great question in the election. Um, when, when they are reminded again and again of who he is and how he talks, uh, who wins the American suburbs? John, we only have 30 seconds left, but obviously everybody knows your hometown team are the Red Sox. They are four and two. I know it's early. Who do you think they play in the World Series, John? <laughs> I love that question. I'll take the Arizona Diamondbacks. Um, you know, I, on, on this group, I, on this group, I like Mookie back in Fenway, though. That would be good to the Dodgers. Uh, but on this group of guys I chat with, I jokingly predicted at the beginning of the year they were going to be 160 and two. All right, so I'm still in. I'm still in, Jim. They've yeah, only lost two. Be. I knew you would I'm in be. until probably tomorrow or the day after. John, your reporting has been spectacular, <laughs> and we're really glad you made time for us again. Thanks so much. Good to see very, you. You're very kind. Thank, Thank you, you John. John King. Speaking with CNN Chief National Correspondent John King and host of All Over the Map and the Battleground reporting project tracking the 2024 campaign through the eyes and experiences of the voters who will pick the next president. Up next, we're going to open up the phone lines and get your thoughts on this exceptionally important topic, instant gratification. Is it from an instant cup of coffee or a cup of noodles or do you love box mashed potatoes? When is instant food good enough? And what's your relationship with instant coffee? You can call or text. You're listening to Boston Public Radio 89.7 GBH, live from the BPL and streaming on youtube.com slash GBH News.
I'm Jared Bowen. Coming up on The Culture Show, the Emmy-winning composer Jeff Beale. You know his work. He gave us the theme song to House of Cards, which became an anthem for power and corruption. He added even more splashes of color to the film Pollock with his vigorous score. Ahead of his concert in Newton, leading the Pro Art Chamber Orchestra, he joins us to talk about his work. That and more is on The Culture Show today at 2 on 89.7 GBH. Funding for our programs comes from you. And Liberty Mutual Insurance. Liberty believes progress happens when people feel secure and exists to help people embrace today and pursue tomorrow. Learn more at libertymutual.com. And Discovery Museum in Acton. Inspiring learning through hands-on science. A new exhibit exploring the properties of cause and effect featuring balls, ramps, and chain reactions is now open. Discoveryacton.org. Welcome back to Boston Public Radio. Jim Browdy, Sue O'Connell in for Marjorie. Marjorie returns tomorrow. We're live at the Boston Public Library and streaming at youtube.com slash GBH News. We'll be back at the library on Friday and on Tuesday of next week. The mayor will join us at the library from 11 to noon. So an article in the failing New York Times, that's what <laughs> Donald Trump calls it, of course, is uh, railing against the merits of good coffee. It's by this lunatic named Peter C. Baker. He argues that instant coffee is, quote, good enough coffee. Mm -hmm. And we don't really need to go through all the trouble of getting fresh beans, grinding and pouring water immaculately over our fancy Chemex machines every morning. Instant coffee might do you just fine. Mm -hmm. That's another quote by Peter Baker and by Sue O'Connell, mm -hmm. which is humiliating, I'd say. <laughs> Might even have a warm nostalgia to it that offers an added boost, plus obviously it's easier. So the lines are open. We want to talk to you about some of the ways instant might actually be better. Is a cup of noodles, instant mashed potatoes, Annie's white cheddar mac and cheese shells. So the answer, when is instant better? It's obvious. Never. <laughs> Jamie long. has never successfully made a roux in his life. That's Jamie Bologna, our leader here. Roux. Uh, roux, right. Uh, yeah. Zoe, love. this is humiliating. Zoe, another of our colleagues, loves buttery market basket instant mashed potatoes mm -hmm. straight from the factory floor. This probably <laughs> says more about the work-life balance of our producers than anything else. But nevertheless, are you also leaning into instant food? Or are you a purist, as I am, as we were talking about on Monday, and really value making your own food the way it was intended, spending hours of intricate labor to make what admittedly may be only mediocre meatballs and coffee? 877-301-897. Can we start with coffee? When you yes. mentioned this morning that you purposely and intentionally and gleefully Have instant make coffee. yourself instant coffee Every in the morning, morning. it is Incredible he's, to he's, me. He's a he's he's gobsmacked. I am worked he's into a frenzy. And why do you do why do you do that? Seriously. Well, I like it, and I honestly I I have a high a high grade instant coffee that is from uh, New Guinea. By the way, it's called a luxury item. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, I okay. grew up drinking uh, um, a Maxwell House instant coffee. That mm. was, I had no idea. My dad was in World War II. He was a vet. He would take his little percolator up and put it on the stove and it would perk over and it would burn and it tasted terrible. So I could count on the quality of my own coffee by making Maxwell House instant coffee. And then of course, you know, when I'm out, I have the Dunks, I have the Starbucks, I have the lovely coffee from our newsfeed cafe, which I But if you had I the choice, you would have instant Every coffee. Every single morning for the past okay. 30 years, I have had a cup of instant coffee and it works three minutes it's done. I have it. I'm ready to go. It's the same every Three time. Three minutes, I make right? It. Three yes, minutes. But it's said. the same every. How long time does it I take me it? to make a pot of fresh coffee every single morning? Well, last time I slept over, I think it was. <laughs> let's see. You got up? No, no, that didn't happen. Three, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. So, no, it's kidding. too late, Some unfortunately. Are no. Three minutes. It does not take. Yes, it does. Three you minutes. know what I do the night before? Since you asked. <sighs> I pour it. No, I clean the pot from the prior day. You're not counting those. Excuse, minutes? No, it's the night before. Yep. And I <laughs> throw out the deadline. coffee grounds and I grind the beans. Yeah. I put them in the damn thing. I get up the next morning. I press the button. Three minutes later, I have fresh coffee. So I'm one. I'm appalled by that. I have to say, and I'm serious about this. I know. I can the tell. The only thing more appalling than you, who I greatly admire, <laughs> or did, did uh, than instant coffee. The fact that Zoe. Of course, oh, Zoe. Zoe eats in the afternoon. She eats dinner at 3.30, which is a whole other story. <laughs> that Zoe prefers instant mashed potatoes. I would say that is the single worst instant product 
of them all. Mash, you eat that too, instant mashed potatoes? No, I don't. Uh, okay, no, I no don't she's eat lying. That. No, and I don't. And Nicole, our other colleague, says the best noodles I've ever eaten instant chow mein teriyaki mm. beef. I order in bulk, so unhealthy, but keeps my spirit alive. Yes, I mean, really. Not, is there anything instant that you, you choose? Well, I have to admit, in a moment choose, of seriousness. Not, not, not when it's like not the only choice. I, but. No, not choose, tolerate. <laughs> I can to no, I can tolerate ramen occasionally. When yeah. you're in a rush and you're really, really dying for noodles, that's borderline acceptable. You ever made homemade ramen, which I make quite regularly? Well, again, takes like three me. minutes. You boil the water, right. you throw the damn stuff yeah. in there, you mix it up, and you have fresh the ramen. Point, Jim. The point of some of this isn't the convenience, because I think we have proven that it takes about the same amount of time. I think it's a comfort food. I think for Zoe, it's a comfort food. Just to, her mood has picked up today, just talking about the instant Apparently, potatoes. Apparently, it's rather sad. So I think it's about the feelings that people have about it. Like, I think of my mornings at home, growing up, having a cup of Maxwell House. Okay, and now, by the way, I have to admit, I pay apparently are moderately hypocritical. One of my <laughs> colleagues, who wrote the, who sent this, Jamie, of Oh, course. yeah, there you go. Jamie, who, again, <laughs> is calling in sick and lying on Monday so he can go watch the eclipse. Uh, uh, he says, is this instant? Yeah. And there is a can of broadcast corned corn beef, beef hash, hash, which is one of my favorite foods in the world. And it's true. I do make home beef, uh, homemade corned beef hash, but I more than occasionally break open a can there of you go. instant uh, broadcast. So with that one exception. But I have to say, the notion of drinking... Coffee to me is one of the most important things in my life. And I don't mean that. I have a cup of, couple of cups of yeah. coffee at home. I come to the Newsfeed Cafe mm -hmm. where they have fabulous brewed they coffee. Do. Have it here the minute I walk in the door really early. And it really... I think it says something. I don't mean this well, harshly because <laughs> I love you. It says something about a person who chooses... Inst I just don't get it. I well, really don't get you, it. Maybe I should bring in my high-level instant coffee that I pay a lot of money for from Whole Foods so you can try it and see that it, we could do a taste test. We could do a brewed cup and we could do an instant cup and see if we'll you can tell the We'll do it next time you're on. When are you there on you next week? I, what am I whenever. on? Tuesday? We don't know. Whatever. Tuesday, okay. whenever By the I'm way, here. Jamie obviously has latched onto oh, something Jamie. immature. He is now saying, Jim, <laughs> is this instant? There's a picture of a <laughs> Hebrew national salami. And you I have to say, how many people home, are making their you own salami? Exactly. Okay. So, I mean, really. By the way, before we start, how many people in the audience drink instant coffee by choice? Not one. Why does Starbucks Not sell Not one it? Why in does the whole Starbucks damn sell office? An option? Starbucks actually sells an option of instant coffee. Well, you lost this group. 877-301-8970. Two things. We want your perspective on instant food products in general and if there's one where you're with sue or nicole or zoe or whatever and say this is the exception to the rule this is fabulous you know what's also horrible instant oatmeal is that inedible is terrible. that's in terrible edible. if you're eating instant oatmeal it's doing absolutely nothing for you well it, not only nothing no, it doesn't taste there's no it taste tastes to terrible it, it tastes overly like cardboard sweet. and it's got zero nutritional value in it so okay let's go. go to frank on route 93 hi there frank what's your deal Hi, um, I love Greek and Turkish coffee, and that the best way to have it is uh, powdered. It comes; it actually has like a, a cream in it. Yeah. And then I I I agree with those Bob Evans uh, market basket potatoes. I love them too. No, you don't. Right, so I don't believe. So I really don't believe first, that. First, let me just double check. So it's delicious. You're, you're saying that the instant coffee you drink is powdered coffee, right? So if yeah, I start saying I have coffee. powdered yeah, he coffee said he in the meant morning, instant coffee. okay, I just want to miss it. It That's sounds a little means. bit fancy, okay. but and and you're on board with the mash, the instant mashed potatoes out of the box. Well, Frank. I don't call them instant mashed potatoes. Instant mashed potatoes would be those sawdust stuff in a box. Yeah, that's yeah, what I that is. Those yeah. Packages in the refrigerator. Okay, what is this, Frank? What is what? What is the thing you like at Market Basket if not instant? What is that? <laughs> You um, with, you I with like me? those roasted turk, those chicken roasters. Okay, I have no idea what you're talking about. Now, Frank, before you go away, you told our call screener yeah. in customer service that you actually went to culinary school. Is that true or is that a lie? I went, I went to Johnson Wales and oh I had a restaurant. Oh, my God. See? And Why, Whitey Bulger used to come into my restaurant because of my English muffins and my strawberry jam. 
And if you're really nice, Jim, to me, yeah. I'll give you a jar of my frozen strawberry jam. Well, by the way, if you give me some of your frozen strawberry jam, I'll give you some instant English muffins. Frank, thank you very much for the uh, call. One tester says that instant mashed potatoes are a good butter delivery system. There's that. Um, I don't and... Do you like those? I forget. Did you no, say I you like those no, too? No. Okay. Uh, they taste of... like, do they not taste a little bit like cardboard, honestly? I haven't had them in years. Oh, you haven't? I couldn't okay, tell fine. you. But okay. Stuart and Millis says you cannot taste the difference between instant mashed potatoes and, and I've, mashed I've, potatoes. That's not true. I've had them. One of my kids made <laughs> this them. This is like our, They're inedible. our electric car. They're totally <laughs> inedible. They are. They are. Uh, and by the way, I'm not even sure I believe you. I know you're an honest person. I just don't know if I believe you do that by choice. I just I, don't. I, I do. Does your daughter drink coffee? No, she does not. So oh. the other thing is that I don't want to make a whole pot because I can't drink a whole pot. Yeah. I don't want to use the instant little cup things because oh, environmentally, I'm environmentally whatever. concerned. Okay. So the best answer is... Yeah. A one little tablespoon yeah. of a powdered coffee, yeah, okay, as I'm fine. going to call it from now on. Okay, Al on the road. What's your deal, Al? Hello. Hey, guys. Um, yeah. I agree with you on some of the points. Uh, <laughs> Thank I you. I do enjoy making a cup of coffee. Yeah. But if I'm going backpacking, instant coffee is the way to go. And uh, See, I'm a lesbian. I'm of... always backpacking. <laughs> Lesbians are always ready to go. We're and your always Subaru, ready. right? And my okay. Subaru, uh, exactly. It's a genetic in issue. Clearly. Okay, fine. Uh, continue, Al. Go ahead. Some of the instant boil and bag dinners you take backpacking are pretty good, and some of them uh, I'd rather eat day old roadkill. Yeah. So what is good? Uh, Tell us. Give us an example of something. And assuming you're not hiking, because I won't be hiking anytime soon. <laughs> if you're not hiking, what is what is good on your list of instant things? Uh, I do eat instant oatmeal every morning. Oh, my God. Al, you lost me, man. <laughs> it is really, it is horrible. And why do you do that? Because it's easy or because you like it? I'm at work. Oh, okay. oh well, I mean, I, well. Well, you know, by the yeah, way, Al, you know, you can make oatmeal. I used to Three make minutes. a whole week's worth of oatmeal, overnight oats. And Marjorie actually liked them, too. That's where I melted the banana. We've mm -hmm. talked about that. And bring them in and put them in the microwave. How about that? I will definitely take that under consideration. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you. I appreciate your support. Thank you very much. 877-301-8970. Listen to this. Aaron from uh, Lakeville. Can we, okay. Not only do I make my own corned beef hash, which I did a couple of weeks ago, Aaron, I actually corn cure the brisket myself and make hash with it. That said, I love some Hormel's corned beef hash in a can. On occasion. I mean, that, have you ever had corned beef hash yes. in a can? Yes. I mean, it's really good. I didn't know it existed any other way until so, recently. Me, so, I swear to you, you know, me I either. That that's what it was. Sean from the car, what are your thoughts on fresh cranberry sauce or the stuff that comes out uh, <laughs> of the exact shape of the can? I used to make homemade cranberry, cranberry sauce, sauce for Thanksgiving. I've only made it once in my and life. And I'd put it on the table and my family would look at it what and is say, it? where's the cranberry <laughs> sauce? Swear to God. One of the greatest moments of my young adult life. I would life. bet, I don't know this, I would bet that 90% of the people in America who've eaten cranberry sauce have only eaten Eat it out of, out of a, a can. can. I've had, out of a yeah, can. out of a can. Let's go to Donna somewhere in Massachusetts. What's your deal? Hi. Hi. I cook everything from scratch. Yeah, why? Because that's how my mother uh, taught me, and yeah. I've done it all my life. Now, if someone uh, had you over for dinner and they said, would you like a helping? Let's say you went to Zoe's house for dinner <laughs> and she said to you, would you like a helping of my instant mashed potatoes? What would you say, Donna? Uh, to be polite, I would eat it. Yeah, wow. One polite bite. You're a one nicer Donna, person do you than use, I. Um, do you use jarred uh, tomato sauce, tomato gravy? Tomato gravy, that's right. No, I make it from scratch. Okay. okay. Donna's my kind of woman. I know, I'm just uh, Donna, checking. I'm with you. Thank you. You make it yourself. You know how easy it is to make a good marinara sauce, oh by the way? Oh, my God, Jim. You must have so much time on your hands. Well, what do you I, do on Sundays? I, I, I oh. uh, Exactly. I cook on Sundays. <laughs> yeah, that's cook what on I do. Sundays. That's true. I know yeah, you do and, that. You know, by the way, the other problem with instant stuff, I should say, even though I should, I'm not as health-oriented in my food consumption as I should be, do you know what the salt level is, the sodium level, yes. which is like blood pressure, hypertension, mm -hmm. heart attack situation, and instant stuff? It's, I bet you it is in coffee, too. Is there? Can you look up, you guys? Is uh, there salt? 
high sodium and instant coffee. And even if there isn't, All right, can so you I lie drink, and say there is? I okay. Drink Mount Mount Hagen instant coffee. That's what I have. Who does? I do. That's my coffee. Mount Hagen instant coffee. Where's that coffee. from again? I get it at the Whole Foods, you right do. by the, the, Whole Foods, the yeah. underwear yeah. section where you like to shop a lot. So I, I look <laughs> for that. I can't go by it without thinking about Jim. Um, and we can check on that. So I've, we've still got supporters here for the co instant coffee. Okay, let's hear it. Uh, this is um, Mike and Swamp Scott. Good instant coffee is so much better than 80% of the coffee out there. Uh, he's got a uh, commuter coffee based out of Gloucester or Little Wolf Ipswich. They have instant coffee packs as well. So he says he's a little, uh, I'm a weird coffee person and brewing my cup each morning is the best part of my day. Is this, is this true or is it you're saying this to humor me? You're saying it to humor me, okay. So, <laughs> whatever, okay, so apparently instant coffee is not as bad for you as I thought it was, but they're attempting to fool me so I make a fool of myself again. Rebecca in Rhode Island, we're talking about instant products which Sue and others like and I have no time for. Hello, Rebecca. Hi. Hi. Um, I just wanted to, to echo the sentiments that uh, I, I, although I do brew my own espresso in the morning with whole beans, when you're traveling and as a necessity, I have to have, you know, espresso right away. And I would say that Cafe Bustello does the trick. Uh, Bustello is really good. I agree with that. I, I do have to agree with that. It's good. Yeah. But you, have, you do that because like, well, you have no choice, right? When you're traveling, you're traveling. It's true. Yeah. And I could be in different countries and that's like the best option. So I have to say that's not bad. But the, but the other thing I did want to say is... Um, nobody talked about brown bread in a can. Oh. And growing up, that was something <laughs> that yeah. my mom yep. would serve. And, and I used to think it was kind of gross, but it's so good now if you like... It, not that I serve it all the time, but if you... You know, grilled it, put some butter on it. It's pretty amazing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You're an honest woman, there, Rebecca. Say, thank Rebecca. Thank you for your thank call. You. My mother was such a terrible cook. Mine too. A terrible, terrible cook. And she actually ended up teaching cooking, which I think is a hysterical, um, you know, ironic twist on my mother's life. But I remember after one Thanksgiving dinner, for some reason, the McDonald's, the one McDonald's in the 1960s on Squire Road, which was open uh -huh. in Revere. My dad and I went there and had um, a, a, a McDonald's meal, and it was the best thing I ever ate. I can't believe day. you mentioned Thanksgiving. Every time, my mother, and by the way, she wouldn't be offended if she were alive. She, she was the worst cook, I think, ever. Mm -hmm. Maybe ever in the history of the world. And we used to have people over for Thanksgiving. And she took criticism, which I, I really angered me from some of the relatives that she didn't make the turkey. And it, she took criticism not well. And one year she said... <laughs> This was unbelievable. She said she was going to make the turkey and all, and as Marjorie would say, all the fixings, that kind of thing. And so the first thing that happens is people are sitting two rooms over for the kitchen waiting, and one of my relatives says to my mother, I don't smell anything. <laughs> and she said, well, I have the fan on in the kitchen. Well, let me go. No, don't go in the kitchen. This is a totally true story. And it turns out uh, dinner was supposed to be, I don't know, at 5 o'clock, at 6 o'clock, at 6.30. Not only is there no smell, there's no food. She had ordered everything delivered and those are the days by the way when nothing was yeah. delivered yeah, was like a whole wealthy. turkey right, a whole yeah, and yeah. she wasn't she was working yeah. three jobs and it was one of the most humiliating days of her life which oh, still was really sad by the way but having said that it was edible as opposed to the other things yes. right, exactly well we always we order out for all of our holidays even if we get a pre-sliced that's ham. pretty fun these days is <laughs> yes, it not yes, there's a, that's a loaded thing about the ham <laughs> we won't share that with you now an anonymous texter asks a question that oh. i am not qualified to ask but i bet you answer but you are, is a tea bag considered <gasps> instant? And I, like I guess that. the answer is yes. And so I do use tea bags. Use tea bags. And what's the difference between the tea bags and pre roasted instant coffee? Well, uh, not, uh, none. And I'm embarrassed. Okay. However, I don't know what it's called. What's the thing called, the little thing that you put loose tea in and then you the do the tea ball, I believe. The tea ball. Now, when you do that, which yeah. I admittedly don't do that, that's fun and really tastes rich and great. But Does you can't use not? the microwave. You have to use boiled water on that because uh, tea enthusiasts are we against can, why, microwave why can't you, water. I have no you idea. You can't boil? You if you go to Great Britain and or ask a British person if they want a cup of tea and you or my, my former brother-in-law <laughs> and you put the, the cup in the, in the microwave and turn it on, they freak out. You know, Nicole asked Look a really it. good question. Our colleague, Nicole, asked a really good question. Is tap water instant <laughs> water? And the answer is, actually, yes. it's funny you say that, mm -hmm. Nicole. You may have a hard time believing this. When I am making coffee, before I, uh, before, you know, I make it fresh in the morning, I take a bucket outside and wait for it to rain. <laughs> I do. I capture the rain, bring it in the house, and save it for a sunny day. What about day. pasta? Pasta out of a box. 
Is that instant? I mostly eat fresh pasta from Capone's. There you go. So is that instant, though? I mean, yeah, I would yeah. say it is. Yeah, I, would, I mean, it's not instant in like the mashed potato right. kind of thing. You know, I haven't had them in a while. They're like flakes, right? They're like little I pathetic flakes. I can't remember flakes. when I ever had them. Lauren actually. and Newton, you're next on uh, Boston. Oh, you only have 30 seconds. Oh, I forgot. Uh, got uh, go fast. Away. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Hi. I'm going to be super quick. Please. We're talking about... Uh, making one cup for yourself, and that's why you make instant coffee, and I think that's pretty terrible. And I want to suggest compostable K-cups, mm. which you could put in your Keurig. I didn't know that. Mm. Well, okay. by the way, we're yeah, on it. Where do you get them? Give us a brand quickly. Do you have a brand or a store? Uh, San Francisco is a brand, and okay. you can get them right on Amazon. Lauren, you're the best. Thank you. That takes away your argument. Thank oh, you well. very much, I Lauren. Do we really I, like appreciate it. It. I do it because I like okay, it. Okay, fine. All right, you have We're to say done. goodbye. I am saying goodbye. Thank <laughs> you for listening to another edition of Boston Public Radio, and thanks to everyone who came down to the BPL to watch the show. We really appreciate it. Keep with us, up with us 24-7 by way of our podcast. Tune in tomorrow. Marjorie is finally Yay. back. By the way, you've been fabulous. Thank you. And it's Andrea been fun. was fabulous Thank on you. Monday. We talk with Maya and Gilly Roman, a family of one of the hostages taken, actually two, one of whom has been released, one of whom has been not on October 7th. Also, retired federal judge Nancy Gertner, GBH's Chris Burrell, political scientist uh, from UMass Amherst and former Somerville mayor, now president of Northeast Clean Energy Council, Joe Curtitoni, together with the COO oh, of Hydro Quebec. Oh. That's great. Our crew is Zoe Matthews, Aiden Connolly, Nicole Garcia, and Hannah Laws. Hannah, I bet you, does not eat instant <laughs> crap. Our engineer is John McClaw Parker. Our executive producer is Jamie Bologna. Special thanks to our BPL staff. That's Manny Geyer, Patrick Lally, Carly Corcoran, Isabella Karen, Sandra lopez Birkin. As always, thanks to the wonderful people at the Newsfeed Cafe and across the street at the Lennox. I want to remind for the uh, one additional time, today is Library Giving Day. It's a national one-day fundraising event to support your favorite library, our favorite library, with no close second is the BPL. If you share that perspective, go to bplfund.org and make a contribution, please. I'm Jim Browdy. I'm Sue O'Connell. Sue, it was great to have you. Have great a great day. You. Marjorie's back tomorrow. We hope you see you then. Bye. Thank you.